and good morning all. Let me first of all say and thank you all for joining us this morning at the Dominican Society as we present our annual Prostate Cancer Medical Symposium. This morning, we have some very knowledgeable and experienced medical professionals who will be sharing with us on different aspects of prostate cancer. We have about eight medical practitioners who will be speaking this morning. We have Dr. Marie Brown, Dr. Bobby Wan, Dr. Colette Antoine, our guest speaker, Dr. Jose Rodriguez from the Hospital de Occidente in Mexico, Mexico, Dr. Gofor, Dr. Pemberton, Dr. Reed, and Dr. Stephen Alexander. We have these medical practitioners who are knowledgeable in the field, and we are here at the Dominican Society thanking them to be on board this morning to share on different aspects of prostate cancer. This morning, without our partners, this conference would not be successful. So this morning, I want to say and thank the Jamaica Urological Society for partnering with Jamaica Cancer Society in hosting this annual symposium and our sponsors on board you know, it takes cash to care. And uh, as a cancer society, we depend, we depend heavily on these partners and our sponsors. So I want to say thanks to Abbott, Apex Radiology, Medical Products Limited, the National Health Fund, Ferrin Pharmaceuticals, and last but by no means least, we thank the Guardian Group Foundation for being on board this September as we have our prostate cancer symposium and creating awareness among Jamaican and otherwise. So this morning, let's sit back at home where you are. And again, thanks to all the persons who have joined, the medical doctors, the student nurses. Thank you all for being with us at the cancer this morning. You could have been elsewhere but you choose to come to the Cancer Society and we appreciate your presence. So again, thanks to you all for joining and without much ado, I'll hand over to our moderator for this morning's symposium, Ms. Trillian Brown, our public relations manager at the Cancer Society. And I thank you all again and have a good day. Trillian, over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another prestigious staging of the Jamaica Cancer Society Medical Symposium. We are now being joined by Dr. Marie Brown. Her topic is screening, diagnosis, and staging of prostate cancer. Dr. Brown is a consultant urologic surgeon at the St. Anne's Day Hospital. Go ahead, please, Dr. Brown. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Prostate Cancer Medical Symposium. Am I talk today is on screening diagnosis and staging of prostate cancer. And I'm Dr. Marie Brown. And the outline of my presentation is according to the title. Prostate cancer is the most common and lethal cancer in Jamaica. In 2018, GlobalCon reported 72 per 100,000 cases. By 2020, this had increased to 87.6. Um, per 100,000 cases. Mortality rate remained fairly constant. Prostate cancer incidence far exceeds that of breast cancer and all other cancers in men. In terms of the mortality, this also exceeds breast cancer and all other cancer in men. So prostate cancer is indeed the most lethal in our population. The early stages of prostate cancer are asymptomatic and that is why we recommend screening um, ongoing with PSA or the prostate specific antigen and a digital rectal examination. 
The digital rectal examination is where we place a moisturized glove finger um, in the anus. This can be done standing or laying, um, and it lasts only a few seconds. The PSA, or the prostate-specific antigen, is a protein that is produced by the glandular tissue of the prostate, which is involved in liquefaction of seminal fluid. The PSA elevation can be due to a disruption in the glandular architecture of the prostate, where in prostate cancer, there is loss of the basal cell layer, and this basically leads to leaching of PSA into the bloodstream, and this can be detected by a simple blood test. There are several types of screening, and I've mentioned here case finding, mass screening, multiphasic screening, opportunistic, periodic health examination, targeted screening. But of note, mass screening is where there is a systematic approach to the level of the population or any major demographic, demographic groups um, targeting all men over 40 for example, in prostate cancer. And this is usually initiated by health authorities. Opportunistic screening, on the other hand, is usually done as a part of a clinical encounter for some other health condition. And in the European arm of the screening trials, uh, Gutmann did a comparison of systematic and opportunistic screening. And what they found was that there was a reduction in overall diagnosis and mortality when systematic screening was involved. However, in opportunistic screening, there was a higher rate of overdiagnosis with a marginal survival benefit in the opportunistic group. The goals of prostate cancer screening are to detect potentially lethal cancer at an early stage and to intervene with curative intent and lower the burden of overall treatment. PSA represents the mainstay of prostate cancer screening. There are two main screening trials that uh, look at the benefits of screening. And the first one we look at is the prostate, lung, colon, and ovarian um, screening trial. And this included um, in the prostate arm um, over 380,000 men ages between 55 and 74 years. And men were randomized to screening um, with annual PC and dig digital rectal examination or no screening at all. The, Biopsy threshold was a PSA of four nanograms per ml. The Europeans also had their screening trial involving over 182,000 men between the ages of 55 and 69 years. And they were subjected to randomized either no screening or annual screening with a PSA and DRE. The biopsy threshold in the European group was 10 nanograms per ml. However, in one center, the Goldberg trial, they used a PSA threshold of three nanograms per ml, and they did a two-year um, interval of screening as compared to the other centers, which did a four-year interval. And the findings were from the European trial that there was a 21% reduction in prostate cancer mortality when they implemented screening um, at the previous previously explained um, methodology. What they also found was that as time progresses, the benefit of screening improved, where the numbers invited to screen um, to, in order to diagnose prostate cancer progressively decreased. The PLC American-based trial showed that there was no reduction in mortality with screening. And even at 16.7 years of follow-up, they still reported no significant um, benefit to screening. In fact, they reported a 17% increase in low-grade um, disease and an 11% decrease in high-grade disease. Uh, this is um, a table showing the up to 16-year follow-up um, from the European trial the numbers needed to screen and the numbers needed to treat to prevent um, prostate cancer death. And from the numbers, you can see a reduction with time and the numbers needed to treat was also reduced in order to prevent prostate cancer death. Of note, these numbers um, were less in the, than those found in the, breast, in the breast cancer trials. So both the ERSBC and the PLCO trials, they reported the 
an extent of um, contamination, which is exposure to PSA screening and DRE. Also, um, at the time of um, initiation in the trial, the ERSPC was lower at 20 to 25% contamination, while the PL, PLC reported up 77% uh, um, contamination at five years, and some studies even quote up to 90%. This contributed to the lower than expected number of deaths in both arms of the trial, because the men who were in the on-screen group were actually screened. So despite the high level of contamination, in 2012, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force released a recommendation against PSA-based screening. They gave it a grade B recommendation. However, in 2017, they updated their recommendation and suggested that men aged 55 to 69 years should be informed about the risk and benefits of PSA screening as there might be an associated small survival benefit. As a result of this, the grade D recommendation was upgraded to a C. Of note, none of these studies were designed to estimate if PSA screening actually influences overall mortality. But in the European study, they showed that mortality from prostate cancer in the absence of screening was higher in the Netherlands compared to the US. But then also with the contamination from the PLCO trial, that actually showed that a lot more men were being screened in the US, and this could also lead to the reduction in the mortality scene in the American population. The bulk of the evidence, though, is for men between the ages of 55 and 69 years. None of these studies had the power to analyze for ethnicity. The aim of early detection of prostate cancer is to reduce mortality. And this early detection is driven by PSA, as we had said before. And then this is followed by um, prostate biopsy for diagnostic confirmation. Early detection and screening both imply detection of disease at an early or pre-symptomatic stage when a man would have no reason to seek medical care, and therefore men at risk of prostate cancer should be targeted and screened in order to achieve this goal. And who are these people at risk? So we have the average risk man, which is a man less than 40 years old, not of African descent, no family history of prostate cancer, or no previous history, um, personal history of prostate cancer. The high risk men are those older than 50 years old, of African descent, which 97% of our population is, those with a positive family history, especially a first degree relative who was diagnosed less than 65 years, men with mutations in the BRCA genes, especially type 2, but also type 1, and men with accelerated factors such as smoking, high fat diet, obesity, and physical activity. When should screening begin? In Jamaica, the Ministry of Health and Wellness have actually put together some guidelines for primary um, health care to achieve the goal of increased screening in Jamaica. And a recommendation is since we're a high risk population um, with a large African ethnicity, that we should start screening at 40 years old. And the recommendation for men 40 to 54 years is that they should have a PSC and a digital rectal examination. Upon evaluation, if the digital rectal examination is abnormal or they have a PSA greater than three nanograms per ml, they should be referred to a urologist. If the PSA is less than three but greater than one, they should repeat um, the PSA in a year. If it's less than one, they should repeat at two years. For men 55 to 69 years, annual PSA and rectal examination are recommended. And again, if there's an abnormal digital, digital rectal examination or a PSA greater than three nanograms per ml, they should be referred to a urologist. For PSAs less than three, but greater than one, annual PSA is recommended. And for PSA less than one in this age group, annual PSA, but it may also be done at the two years, depending on the discretion of the urologist or primary care physician. We do not recommend screening for men older than 70 years old, unless a clinical decision is made where there would be benefits um, to this patient who has a long expected, um, a long life expectancy, then a digital rectal examination and a 
PSA should be done, but this is based on a case-by-case um, -case basis. And this slide basically gives a summary of everything that I said before, just a pictorial view of it. What are the side effects of screening? Overdiagnosis, this is the most common um, side effect with a report of up to 42%. The complications requiring hospitalization within 30 days after biopsy, that is quite low and reported in about 4% of cases. And infection, infectious causes are usually the most common. Fatal complications of prostate cancer screening are rare. Move on to diagnosis. The diagnosis is made based on an elevated PSA um, the normal lab values locally are PSAs levels between zero and four and greater than four is reported abnormal. However, in men 40 to 69 years old, a PSA greater than three nanograms per ml is considered to be abnormal. And, and in addition to that, um, or separate and apart, an abnormal DRE is also um, an an indication for um, review by urologists. PSA is the most common um, biomarker that is used um, in the initial screen of mena arteries or prostate cancer. However, this is limited and other biomarkers have been explored to aid in the screening of men at risk for prostate cancer. And the goal is to either rule out the need for initial or subsequent um, biopsies. And there are various urine-based um, biomarkers that have been studied, and these mainly have been validated to assess the risk of clinical significant cancer in men with or without a prior biopsy. Um, these um, are on, not available in Jamaica. There are also blood-based biomarkers, and these again help to assess for, the, for clinical significant prostate cancer. And the tissue-based um, biomarkers are also available internationally, however not in Jamaica. The performance of these tests is, however, limited by the tumor multifocality and heterogeneity of prostate cancer. These biomarkers are not included in the guidelines. Further studies are required um, in order to utilize these. Once there is an abnormal um, PSA or DRE, um, the patient is required to undergo a prostate biopsy, and this is where the patient is placed in a left lateral or lateral decubitus position. The prostate is imaged on an ultrasound, the, then anesthetized, and a needle is used to remove small fragments from the prostate. The standard is a 12-hour systematic biopsy, um, where apical and far lateral cores are are taken as well. For locally advanced or metastatic disease, a sextant or six core biopsy can also be employed. And these fragments are then sent to the pathology department to be examined by a genital urinary pathologist or any pathologist that is available. Transrectal ultrasound guided prostate biopsy is the most common method, but there's also transperineal prostate biopsy which involves passing the needle through the perineum to obtain samples from the prostate. This has the benefits of a lower risk of serious infection, and it also helps to target anterior prostate and apical areas as well. This, however, is more difficult to perform under local anesthesia, and so general anesthesia is required, and it's unfamiliar to most urologists. MRI-guided prostate biopsy can also be implemented, and this is where the biopsy is targeted based at the MRI-detected lesions, and this helps improve the yield and grade assessment. The current guidelines recommend the performance of both a targeted sample and a template um, biopsy in men who have MRI-targeted lesions. MRI-guided biopsy can be done using various methods, cognitive fusion, software-based fusion, or in-bore um, prostate biopsy. The most commonly performed uh, method, however, is a cognitive fusion, where the MRI lesion is located um, and assessed by the urologist with or without the help of a radiologist, and biopsies are di directed at the area of concern 
based on the MRI, but from the ultrasound imaging. There's a software um, based technique where the MRI images are fused with the ultrasound images and then the biopsy is directed at these um, targeted areas. The inborn prost MRI prostate biopsy is done in the MRI suite. Other methods of biopsy include a saturation biopsy, which is not so commonly done um, lately because of the increased utility of MRI. But this can be used to improve the diagnostic ability of um, prostate biopsy, especially in men who have had a previous negative biopsy and are, are negative um, multiparametric MRI, but has um, an elevated or persistently elevated um, PSA. A finger guided biopsy can be done, but this is only in situations where ultrasound guidance is not readily available and an obvious prostate mass is palpable. At this time, fewer biopsy cores can be taken, but there's a significant increased risk of middle stick injury to the operator. Now we move on to staging of prostate cancer. And we use the 2017 um, AJCC classification for prostate cancer, where we look at a primary tumor, the presence of regional nodes and distant metastases. Primary tumor, they're rated as a T1, T2, or T3 with various subdivisions, as you can see here. The tumor aggressiveness is dependent on the Gleason grade and score, as well as the grade groups. The Gleason score is a summation grading system whereby two grades are employed primary grade, which is the most prevalent, and a secondary grade, which is the highest grade, and then they're summed together. The lowest grade that can be achieved is a three, while the highest is five. And this results in a score in system from minimum of six to 10. In 2014, the International Society of Urological Pathologists and the World Health Organization introduced a decent grade group system, and this employs um, groups from one to five, which includes a Gleason score from uh, six to, um, to a 10. And based on the Gleason score, they're given a grade grouping. Risk assessment is paramount in guiding the treatment and treatment and decisions, and also help for counseling patients accurately about the expected oncologic and functional outcomes. Factors involved in the risk stratification process are the PSC at the time of diagnosis, the clinical staging based on the rectal examination, and the Gleason score slash grade. And based on these risk factors, um, patients can be cat categorized in risk group. And the main risk groups that we use are the American Urology Association Risk Stratification and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Risk Stratification. The AUA, or risk group, involves very low risk, low risk, intermediate, and high risk. And the patients based on their PSA DRE and their Gleason score or grade group score are placed in these categories. The NCCN also had theirs, but theirs a little bit more extensive, involving very low, low, intermediate, and with intermediate, that is further subdivided into favorable and unfavorable groups, and um, continuing with high and very high um, risk groups. And this helps to determine what additional imaging are required to complete the staging process and to um, determine which treatment option would be the best for the patient. And the staging investigations are based on these risk stratification as well as the life expectancy of the patient. So for patients with a life expectancy less than five years, um, and they're in the very low, low or intermediate risk groups, no imaging is required for these um, patients. However, if the patient is symptomatic, then we'll do that. If initially, if the patient is asymptomatic, we could wait until symptoms develop in our, and then do these staging investigations. In patients with a life expectancy less than five years, but are in the high or very high risk group, then these patients should be um, subjected to having bone imaging as well as pelvic imaging with or without abdominal imaging. If, they, if there is nomogram prediction of lymph node involvement, the bone scan can be achieved by the conventional
external technetium 99 bone scan, but other modalities can be employed, such as brain film, CT scan, MRI, um, PET CT or PET MRI, and choline or PSMA PET scan can also be done um, for these patients. Soft tissue imaging um, of the pelvis can be achieved with um, abdominal pelvic CT or MRI. Chest can also be included with a chest CT scan. Multiparametric MRI is preferred over CT for pelvic imaging, however, and alternately, the PSMA PET scan as well as the PIFLU for last start PSMA PET scan or PET MRI can also be considered for bone and soft tissue imaging um, as well. So if these are available, then these can be done in, um, as an alternate to CT or MRI of the pelvis. So in summary, prostate cancer is the most lethal cancer in the, the Jamaican population. Utilization of systematic screening should be encouraged. The diagnosis is confirmed with a prostate biopsy and staging investigations are dependent on the risk category and life expectancy. And this include bone and soft tissue imaging um, investigations. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. We are now being joined by Dr. Wan, who presents can you, can you Prevent Prostate Cancer? So Dr. Wan works at the Winchester Business Center and the Medical Associates Hospital. He's a consultant urologist, and his area of specialization is general urology prostate cancer. He holds an MBBS from the University of the West Indies and qualifications FRCS, Ananda, and a urology. Special interest outside of medicine, music, and photography, and he's also the chairman of the Kingston College Chapel Choir. Okay, I would like to thank the Jamaica Cancer Society for inviting me to participate in this symposium. We usually start thinking about prostate cancer prevention when we become aware that we have developed risk factors, such as a family member or a friend getting this condition, then we become even more serious that we may have been diagnosed with a significant cancer later on as things progress. And we think in terms of preventing this cancer from getting worse. So what causes cancers? We are composed of trillions of cells, and over time, these cells replicate themselves using a type of code embedded in our chromosomes and genes and DNA. And as our tissues replicate themselves, those who do it more rapidly, we may get errors in transmission of the code and mutations, and some of these actually lead to development of cancers. So, so cancers may be just due to plain bad luck, but maybe up to a third or some, or possibly even more may be due to environment and lifestyle and preventable factors. Some of these preventable factors we know already, cigarette smoking, excessive drinking, excessive overweight, unsafe sex, not willing to take the HP vaccine, especially in women. So what about genes? I have been aware recently, some of my patients have these gene mutations, which predispose them to developing bad cancers. Unfortunately, they were detected after we diagnosed the patients with cancer. But if we had recognized before that they had this mutation in their family, maybe with early detection and screening, we could have found the cancers at an early stage. Unfortunately, we have not developed enough science-wise to correct these gene mutations. But what we can do is encourage people to live a healthy lifestyle. So here was a study done, the Nurses Health Study and Health Professionals Follow-up Study, 
and they looked at individuals who had a healthy lifestyle. So what was a healthy lifestyle? They didn't smoke, they didn't drink, they weren't too fat, they weren't too skinny, and they exercised. And when they looked at those who had a healthy lifestyle versus, versus those who did not, there was in fact a significant reduction of cancer mortality in those who had a healthy lifestyle. So there are some preventable factors that come into play. What about prostate cancer? So some prostate cancers are lethal, as you will learn in other presentations, and some are not so bad. So the lethal prostate cancers were in fact significantly reduced in the men who had a healthy lifestyle. The overall incidence of prostate cancer may not have been reduced, but there's something that could be done in lowering the risk of death and suffering from prostate cancers. So what else can we do? Here is an interesting study which was done some time ago in Finland. They took smokers and tried them with vitamin E and beta carotene to see if they could reduce lung cancers. There was no reduction in lung cancers. But those who took vitamin E had a reduced risk of prostate cancer. So this was a very encouraging study for vitamins. So later on, a huge study was done. This is a select trial where they used selenium and vitamin E and tried to study patients to see if they could reduce their risk of prostate cancer. Unfortunately, they had to stop the study early. And the reason is that they did not reduce prostate cancer. And in fact, prostate cancer was increased in those who took vitamin E. So we have to be cautious about taking vitamins to prevent cancers. So this is one of the headlines that came out. As you can imagine, at the time, these, this study uh, got a lot of press, and this was a kind of frightening headline that came out. So what about multivitamins? There have been suggestions that taking multivitamins could actually reduce our risk of cancers. And this, this, this report came out in recent months. Again, the health professional um, follow-up study and what it showed us that multivitamin use did not increase, but also did not reduce the risk of prostate cancer. So, so the US Preventative Task, Forces, Task Force um, group recommends on various things every year. This year, they updated their recommendation on vitamins, and they stated that beta carotene and vitamin E cannot be recommended for prevention of either heart disease or cancers. And they didn't have enough evidence to say that multivitamins don't. So I don't mind if patients take multivitamins. I'd say don't take megavitamins. But what about zinc? A lot of patients take look for preparation that contains zinc to see if these would prevent uh, prostate cancer. There was, there have been several studies in fact, but here's one from the health professional study. Again, we show that taking zinc doesn't really reduce the risk of prostate cancer. And there's a danger that it may actually increase the risk of, of cancers. So I don't recommend zinc. I know that everybody says that zinc is is, a, is, a, is highly concentrated in prostate, but there's no real evidence that it prevents prostate cancer. So here was a study which was done when finasteride came out. At that time, it was marketed as Proscar. Now it's marketed here as, as Proscar and Fincar. So it's, it's used to treat enlarged prostates. So a study was done to see if finasteride could prevent prostate cancer. It in fact did reduce the risk of developing prostate cancers. But here's a drawback. In, in men who took finasteride, there was a slight increase in the risk of getting these bad cancers, these so-called lethal cancers, versus those who did, did not take finasteride. 
again, these drugs, finasteride and eutesteride, the latter is marketed as, as, as Avodart and, and, and Duodart. They have been shown to have some, some, some effect on reducing the risk of prostate cancer progression in men who have an early um, prostate cancer. But currently, we do not advise that men take finasteride or dutesteride to prevent cancers because of that risk that I mentioned that they could be exposing themselves to developing more aggressive cancers if they do develop cancers. So here's a study from the health professional uh, follow up uh, study again, which showed that this danger is probably overrated that men who took these medications, they did not experience an increase in lethal cancers or cancer deaths. So it's one for the guys who want to use finasteride or butesteride. But as I said, we cannot recommend that we use these drugs to prevent cancers, but we use them a lot in men with enlarged prostates who do not have prostate cancer. Good news for the guys who are diabetics, if they are taking metformin, maybe they could reduce their risk of dying from prostate cancer. Again, we do not recommend that we take this, these medications to prevent prostate cancer. But if you are a diabetic and you have been prescribed metformin, it's a good idea to stay on that drug. Similarly for the guys with elevated cholesterols, a lot of men over 50 are taking a statin to reduce their cholesterol. It may be chimvastatin or rosuvastatin or another of the newer ones. Again, there's some evidence that taking a statin can reduce the risk of getting uh, prostate cancers. Again, we cannot recommend that you take these drugs to prevent prostate cancer if you have a normal cholesterol level. Surely, if you have a high cholesterol level, it's a good idea to take one of these medications. I know guys are afraid of taking statins for whatever reason. I see no reason why they should not take it. Can't say the same for aspirin. A lot of patients are taking aspirin because they're afraid of getting a heart attack or a stroke. And some are taking it to try to prevent cancers. There's no evidence that it prevents cancers. I know there was some talk about this uh, years ago. So now the recommendation is that you should not take aspirin to prevent cancers. And as some of you may have read in recent times, maybe if you're over 65 and you do not have heart disease, you should not be taking aspirin at all. So, a lot of my patients are taking this fellow here, Guinea hen weed. And a lot of them were thinking of taking ball mass, uh, which grows in my yard and it goes on the telephone wires around Kingston. That one is not so popular. But looking back at the Guinea hen weed, it still remains a fairly common usage among the patients that I see. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find any evidence of any clinical trials that shows that either of these products have any effect on either prostate cancer prevention or prostate cancer treatment. But I do not stop patients from taking them. I said, fine, if you want to take this, go ahead. But if we say, maybe you should do something about your prostate, like surgery or radiation, you should definitely do that. So alternative medicine is fairly popular. Here's one poll that came out a few years ago in 2018. And not surprisingly, almost 50% of Americans poll believe that alternative medicine would cure cancers. So Here's one publication came out a few years ago, and these people have published on it several times since then, that when they look at cancer patients who take alternative medicine only, and they match them with people who take conventional medicine, 
death rate from cancers is much higher in people who take alternative medicine. So that's, that's a sobering thought. Complementary medicine is kind of the same thing. Again, the same workers, people who choose complementary medicine, again, have a higher risk of dying of their cancers. And it was a group of cancers, as you can see, there were breast cancer patients, prostate cancer patients, lung cancer, and colon cancer patients. But whatever the, the, the source of their cancers, Choosing complementary medicine or alternative medicine increases the risk of dying of cancers compared to people who choose conventional medicine. And what is conventional medicine in this case? It's mainly radiation, chemotherapy, hormonal treatment, and surgery. Okay, so, so what else can we do? We can lose the processed meat. Processed meat is bacon is the one that people pick on. It increases the risk of cancers, um, especially colon cancers, bacon sausages. Red meat, we believe, increases the risk of prostate cancer. So maybe we should lose the bacon, lose the sausage, and limit the steak and the jerk pork. Grilled meats, especially, if, if you grill the meat and it's too hot and it gets charred, that's dangerous, that definitely could increase our risk of cancers. So what's good? Vegetarian diet has much going for it. So, so here's a study that was just published this year that eating the processed meat, as we say, increase our risk of prostate cancer. It may be a mild increase, but it's an increase. But if you are vegetarian, not just cancers, less risk of heart disease. But here the problem with being vegetarian. This is a study done in doctors. Only 1% of them were strict vegetarian. So it's a very tough diet to follow. Nevertheless, if you can go on a vegetarian diet or a vegetarian-based diet, you can reduce your risk of lethal cancers. And there have been studies that link PSA levels with vegetarian diet. And what it shows, not surprisingly, that if you're a vegetarian diet, a plant-based diet, you're likely to have a lower PSA than the guy who's eating a lot of red meats. Again, this supports the guys who eat fish and vegetarian diet. So, it's very hard to stick to a vegetarian diet. This is the kind of diet that maybe most of us could, could deal with. A vegetarian diet or a diet that mimics the Mediterranean diet. Increase our veggies and our fish. We reduce the red meat. We have mainly olive oil and cut out some of the other abnormal fats. Maybe some nuts and maybe lower risk of progression of prostate cancers if you stick to this type of diet. Again, it's not so easy to change that. Can it be done? Yes, we can change our diet. And this is a study that was done with men to see, hey, if you follow up these guys, you call them regularly, make sure they're having their vegetables, could you influence their diet? And yes, but it required a lot of work. You, you have to keep calling them and writing them and see if it makes any difference. They, they actually did manage to change their diet, but unfortunately, it didn't make much difference to their prostate cancers. So this one is free now. The exercise thing is free. It, we all know that it improves our health. There is some evidence that it reduces mortality in men with prostate cancer. And one of the problems with prostate cancer is, is the medication. Some of the medications, like like the, what's called luprolide, it reduces muscle mass, reduces bone density, and maybe exercise will help to alleviate some of these side effects. And there's some emerging evidence that maybe it really could influence how a gene's work. So exercise is something that we should think about. The CDC recommends 
or 30 to 60 minutes of moderate exercise five days a week. So the average guy here should be able to walk two miles in, in 30 minutes, five days a week. That's not so bad. Maybe you throw a little bit of, of strength exercises in that. In the USA, they found that less than 25% of individuals indulge in this kind of activity. And I suspect that our figures will closely mimic that theirs. Obesity is not good for prostate cancer. It increases our risk of, of cancers. It's something that we should really look at. Not sure how it works. Maybe it works through insulin growth factors and some other hormones, but it's very difficult to lose weight and it's done mainly through dieting. It's almost impossible to lose weight by exercise. It's not impossible, but almost. What about wine? We have traditionally said that, you know, a guy can have one, one drink a day, whether it's a wine or a red stripe or, or a shot of rum. But if you could abstain from wine completely, abstain from alcohol completely, maybe it will reduce our risk of cancers. And the same for tobacco. The problem with tobacco is mainly lung, of course, um, but it's just not a healthy activity. Uh, I'm not going to recommend marijuana to lower your PSA, so you can ignore that second line. Hey, what's good? Coffee. You drink a lot of coffee, maybe nine, 10 cups a day, reduces your risk of, of mortality and may have some effect on prostate cancer. So coffee is great. Tea is also great. What about sex? This is the good part. If sex is good, but more is better. So men who had sex, well, it was really men who ejaculated 21 times a month versus men who ejaculated maybe three times a month. Men, men who were in the group that ejaculated 21 times a month had a lower risk of prostate cancer. And this was some data from the health professional study. As you can imagine, this study has, really, has uh, got a lot of press. It's still being talked about in the media these days. Every now and again, they trot out these figures, but they haven't changed much since the original publication a few years ago. I think the mechanism by which having frequent ejaculation reduces the risk of, cancer, of prostate cancer is, is not known. I know what the guys say. The guys say they are getting rid of toxins, and, and maybe they are. What about Aki? Well, we get asked that every day, as you can imagine. Uh, there's just no evidence that it causes prostate cancer, so I don't tell my patients, don't, don't eat Aki. That's fine by me. So finally, my recommendations is that have healthy oil, like extra virgin olive oil, have lots of vegetables. We like tomatoes, especially cooked tomatoes. We like veggies, especially from the cruciferous family, broccoli, cauliflower, etc. We like coffee, we like tea, we like fish, especially those that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. We like nuts, no-nos, forget the sodas, limit our carb intake, red meat every now and again, avoid bacon and sausages, exercise, exercise, exercise. Don't smoke. If you must drink, do so in a very limited fashion. So I would like to thank the Cancer Society again for inviting me. And remember guys, please go and check your PSAs. Thank you, Dr. Wan. Excellent, excellent presentation. You're welcome. Before we move on, I'd like to just go back to Dr. Brown. Dr. Marie Brown. Dr. Marie Brown started to volunteer at the Jamaica Cancer Society three years ago, prior to the global pandemic. And since then, she has been sent to St. Anne's Bay Hospital. So that's where she's now posted. The first thing Dr. Brown did was to meet with our branch in St. Anne. And on July 31st, they had a health fair strictly for prostate cancer at Turtle River Park. And I thought that was something to look at. That was something that was commendable 
because Dr. Brown is a fairly young doctor and it's the first the branch has ever, ever held a health fair solely and wholly for prostate cancer. And then now the month of September, which we observe as Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, every Monday in the month, and that's a free day for Dr. Brown. She volunteers her time between two to five o'clock where she's screening with our branch, again in St. Anne during those hours. And I'd just like to make mention of that. But that is something that we have to be grateful for that we have these types of persons. And the Jamaica Urological Society has always been a partner with the Jamaica Cancer Society. Even last Friday the 9th, we did over 100 men in Kingston free screening, again, compliments of Guardian Group Foundation. And we screened 120 men. We're going into Mandeville on the 16th of September. We're doing another 100 men there free of charge, again, compliments of Guardian. And in Montego Bay, we're going on the 30th with our partners at Cornwall Regional Hospital and Guardian Life to do 550 men. I just thought I'd make a little mention of that. Now we are being joined by Dr. Colette Antoine, who's a consultant urologist at Spanish Town Hospital. And Dr. Antoine is the first urologist at Spanish Town Hospital as well. So Dr. Antoine, we're ready. Good morning. My name is Colette Antoine and I'm a urologist uh, practicing at the Spanish Town Hospital. I'm also currently serving as the Jamaica Urological Society Secretary, and today I'll be discussing the medical management of prostate cancer. I have no relevant disclosures, and today I'll be discussing the different considerations for managing a patient with prostate cancer, um, the management options for the different disease states, We'll also be looking at the role of testosterone and the androgen receptor, as well as uh, the different drugs used to manage this disease. And please note, I will not uh, be discussing castrate resistant disease, as that will be covered uh, later in the symposium, as well as uh, emergency management. So there are many developments that are happening in the space of prostate cancer, uh, with many new uh, drugs, um, and standards of care uh, being developed. And so we as urologists and also practitioners that are dealing with patients with uh, prostate cancer, we need to be kept abreast so that we can ensure that we're giving our patients the best care that we can. And the goals of this care is to improve survival, we're preventing metastases, improving or maintaining their quality of life, and also preventing any pain or and acute events. So when first evaluating a patient with prostate cancer, uh, we need to consider uh, the patient, we need to consider the disease, we need to consider the risks, and we need to consider uh, what their possible outcomes are likely to be. So with respect to the disease, uh, we do that by reviewing the results of the biopsy, PSA imaging, uh, family history, if there's the tests of any uh, genetic or germline tests are available. Um, and we use that to stratify our patients. So prostate cancer can exist in uh, many different disease states, and it can be either clinically localized or advanced, which includes metastatic disease. Now, patients can present as having either localized disease, they can also present as having locally advanced disease, which we'll discuss in a bit, and they can also present metastatic. Um, or patients can progress. Uh, so they can progress from locally, locally uh, localized disease, sorry, uh, to locally advanced disease. Also, if they've had definitive therapy, so surgery, radiotherapy, uh, some patients can progress uh, despite treatment, so that's called biochemical recurrence, and they can exist in a space that's known as either hormone-sensitive prostate cancer or castrate-sensitive prostate cancer. So that is where uh, the cancer still responds to androgen deprivation therapy. And in this space, they can be either metastatic or not. And if they do have progression, uh, then they can progress to castrate-resistant disease. Now, patients that have localized disease, 
Uh, we use the PSA, the Gleason score, or the Gleason grade group rather, and the clinical stage to classify them as either having low risk disease, intermediate risk disease, or high risk disease. And intermediate risk disease is substratified into favorable and unfavorable. There's also a, a element of patients that can be considered to have locally advanced disease. Um, so that's patients that have either a high clinical uh, stage or they can have spread to lymph nodes, uh, but not uh, distant. So for example, to bone, liver, et cetera. Now patients that have metastatic disease, we need to classify them as either having high volume or low volume disease, um, because that matters in terms of what we're going to offer the patients. So continuing with their initial evaluation. So in assessing the patients themselves, so we need to consider what their life expectancy is, uh, comorbidities, performance status, their values, preferences, what their uh, cardiac assessment of their cardiac and bone health is. Um, as mentioned, you need to be we need to discuss the risks and benefits of treatment. All treatment for prostate cancer will have side effects on very di different organ systems, including urinary sexual bowel. Um, and so that needs to be discussed. And also what their prognosis is likely to be based on the treatment uh, that they choose. And so we need, and we all com combine all of that and we like to use what is called a shared decision-making approach. So looking at the different management strategies, and I've broken this up by disease state. So we're going to be discussing the ones that are highlighted in red on the slide. So active surveillance and watchful waiting um, for patients with localized um, disease or locally advanced disease, um, patients that have recurrent disease, non-metastatic, we can consider observation, androgen deprivation therapy, and metastatic hormone sensitive disease, androgen deprivation therapy plus. So plus our androgen pathway inhibitors, androgen receptor inhibitors, or then chemotherapy. And these patients will be constantly monitored. Um, the frequency of which will depend on their disease state and also, well, the clinical status of the patient. So we'll be constantly assessing their prostate-specific antigen, their PSA levels, imaging, results of the biopsy. We may need to re-biopsy, um, and also genetic testing is available. Um, we also need to monitor and manage any adverse effect events as they arise, and we need to keep encouraging a healthy lifestyle. And these patients are managed with a multidisciplinary approach. So not only the urologists, uh, we have the medical and radiation oncologists, palliative care specialists, pathologists, genetic counselors, general practitioners, to name a few. And so before we go into these management strategies, um, let's consider the drivers of disease. So what makes prostate cancer tick? And it all has to do with androgens. So androgens, namely testosterone, when it combines with the androgen receptor, so you can think of the androgen receptor as a gate, and that gate is what allows the testosterone into the, the, the cell, the prostate cancer cell. And if that gets into the cell, it encourages the cell to grow and keep multiplying and to stay alive, which is what we don't want. So we can affect the disease by manipulating either testosterone, levels of testosterone, or the androgen receptor. And androgens are produced mainly at three sites, so the testicles, the adrenal glands, and the, um, the tumor itself. And so androgen deprivation therapy, um, we can use it across all disease states, works by reducing the testosterone or inhibiting the androgen receptor. And just to note that the what stimulates the testicle to produce uh, testosterone really comes from the brain. So at the hypothalamus and the pituitary, um, that's what sends the signals to the testicles to produce testosterone. Also in within the adrenal gland, there are different um, reactions that happen there and produce that produce testosterone. And so there are many different drugs that we can use to either suppress T or affect the androgen receptor. And we're going to discuss this uh, later down in the talk. Now, 
let's take a step back and let's look at um, a few management strategies. So we're going to start with active surveillance. So active surveillance is where we are monitoring the disease for progression. If progression does occur, we switch to treatment and this is with the intention of curing you of, of, of the patient of prostate cancer. Um, so it's not about foregoing treatment, it's just about timing the treatment. And this is because treatment for prostate cancer, namely surgery and radiotherapy, does have its risks. So we're trying to avoid the side effects of the therapy for as long as they can, we can so that they can have a better quality of life and still cure if we need to. And there is evidence to suggest that active surveillance is a good strategy um, for managing select men. So these are men that have a low risk of progression. And these, so these patients need to be properly risk stratified. Um, so to ensure that they do belong to that, the correct category of having low risk prostate cancer or favorable intermediate risk. And we follow these men up with serial PSAs, DRE, MRI, as well as prostate biopsy to monitor if there is progression. And these patients need to be counseled and um, accept a more um, aggressive follow-up. Now, watchful waiting, on the other hand, is where a patient that has prostate cancer and we do not implement any treatment until they progress. When they progress, at that point, it's just palliative care when the symptoms do arise. And we use this in men that currently don't have any symptoms and have a short life expectancy, so less than five years. Because men that have a limited life expectancy tend to have other competing causes of death, so they're less likely to demise from their prostate cancer. And so the aim is to avoid the side effects of having of local treatment or androgen deprivation therapy so they can live um, the remainder of their years um, with a better quality of life. And so let's move on to the drug therapy. So as we kept saying, androgen deprivation therapy is a foundation of care for all disease states. So we can use it in patients with localized disease um, in combination with radiotherapy. And these this can be given either before, during, or after radiotherapy. And it's typically used for patients with high-risk disease or unfavorable intermediate risk disease. And the, the, the duration of the therapy will depend, uh, will vary depending on um, what risk category they're in. Patients that have biochemical recurrence, so they've had treatment for the prostate cancer, but they still do have residual disease. Um, some patients of those patients can have androgen deprivation therapy. Patients with metastatic disease in combination with other therapies. Um, androgen deprivation therapy is only used as a standalone in patients that have a limited life expectancy and they have symptoms. Otherwise, it is typically used in combination with another treatment, either radiation or one of the other drugs that we will discuss uh, later down um, in this talk. So quick recap, we mentioned that uh, what drives the production of testosterone in the testicles is really comes from the brain and we can use um, some drugs here. So GnRH um, or luteinizing hormone uh, drugs, so either antagonists or agonists uh, to affect that pathway. So antagonists overstimulate the receptors and they cause an initial surge and then a drop in testosterone. GnRH antagonists um, block the receptor and so you get a much quicker um, drop in the testosterone. Which agent we give depends on some various factors. So the modality, so some IM, some are sub -Qs. We also do have a PO formulation. Um, also the timing of the dosing. So they come as depot injections. So uh, one, three, six months, the pill is uh, daily. And also we need to consider what is this patient's cardiac risk? So patients with a uh, higher uh, risk, uh, we will prefer 
uh, to use agents uh, such as uh, Degarelix um, to treat them as they, 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 these patients are shown to do better uh, in terms of their cardiac profile. And so we mentioned that the, the overall effect is to reduce testosterone and it does improve uh, survival, but there are side effects. So you can get, as we mentioned, one of the things that we're concerned about is cardiac side effects, all right? And this is because they can develop what we call metabolic syndrome. Um, also, it can have changes in memory and cognition, also erectile dysfunction, as well as they're at a higher risk of developing osteoporosis and fractures. Another consequence is they can develop, eventually develop castrate resistant disease. Um, but while we, when we're dealing with these patients that are on androgen deprivation therapy, we need to constantly um, monitor for adverse effects and treat as best as we can. We're just going to quickly discuss antiandrogens. So because there is now a large body of evidence suggesting that we have drugs that work a lot better than antiandrogens, um, so we'll discuss these drugs uh, later down. So abiraterone, apalutamide, enzalutamide, docetaxel. Um, there's now a very limited role for using and first generation antiandrogens, um, except when we're managing a uh, testosterone flare when using an LHRH agonist. So just using an anti first generation antiandrogen um, has a, a limited role in managing prostate cancer. So first, let's talk about the androgen synthesis inhibitors. And remember, we spoke about it, it, it works at the level of the adrenal gland. So what abiraterone acetate does, it's a CYP17 inhibitor. So it inhibits uh, CYP17 alpha hydroxylase as well as C1720 lyase. And what that does is it blocks the pathway so you don't get the conversion of cholesterol going all the way down to testosterone. Um, and so that's how we reduce the level of testosterone. Now, it does require the use of continued androgen deprivation therapy, so you still need ADT. Um, and also because you can get excess mineral corticoids, it's given with uh, prednisone. And there are trials to show that it, it does improve overall survival. Um, of patients compared to just androgen deprivation therapy alone, and it can be used either before or after chemotherapy. Now, we need to look out caution in patients that can't tolerate side effects, the side effects of systemic steroids, um, because we do need to give systemic steroids um, with them. So patients that have uncontrolled diabetes, gastric ulcers, infection, patients with uncontrolled heart disease also um, hepatic dysfunction. Uh, we need to be very cautious in those um, patients. So androgen receptor signaling inhibitors. So those are the drug, they also sometimes called a uh, second generation um, antiandrogens or third generation antiandrogens. Um, so namely those drugs are enzalutamide, apalutamide, um, darolutamide also, they all have a similar mechanism of action. And they work by preventing they work in three different ways. So they work by preventing testosterone from binding with the androgen receptor on the cell. It prevents that complex from entering the, the nucleus of the cell. And if it does go into the nucleus of the cell, it prevents it from binding with uh, the DNA, which is what has the downstream effects of uh, increased growth and survival. So it works in three different ways uh, to combat the androgen receptor and the effects of the androgen receptor. And they are shown to improve uh, survival, not only overall survival, but progression um, of prostate cancer. And we do need to look out for uh, side effects. So men with a history of seizures, um, very frail gentlemen, um, and also gentlemen with liver disease, we need to be cautious. Um, so we're gonna move on to chemotherapy. So docetaxel is a taxane chemotherapeutic drug and that works by inhibiting microtubule disassembly. So when the cell is dividing, um, it needs to split 
the genetic material to make two different cells and it prevents that from happening. And so the cell dies and it's a intravenous drug and it is given every three weeks for six cycles. We usually refer these um, men that we want to be on dose taxo uh, to the medical oncologist um, for further assessment. Um, but it is shown to improve survival, particularly in men um, that have high volume metastatic disease. So that's where our risk stratification for patients with metastatic disease is important. And just a note on bone health. So men that are, we mentioned that there are adverse effects of androgen deprivation therapy, and these men are at increased risk of osteoporosis and therefore fractures. And so we need to do a risk assessment of their bone health. And so we can do this by either doing a DEXA scan. It's helpful to calculate their FRAC score. Um, patients with metastatic disease um, may benefit from, are likely to benefit from denosumab or solidronic acid. So those are your bone targeted therapies, but all men that are on androgen deprivation therapy, um, we need to encourage exercise, particularly weight bearing, muscle building exercises, smoking cessation, um, reducing alcohol intake, as well as ensuring that they are taking in adequate um, amounts of calcium and vitamin D. Other things that we need to consider, sequencing, which drugs we should probably give first, which should we give after. And we also need to be mindful, particularly in our setting, what is available. And those drugs, even though drugs may be available, that they do come at a significant cost uh, to the patients. And now these are men that are living longer and we need to consider um, uh, the finances so that they can have continued treatment. Um, of their disease. So in conclusion, um, the management of prostate cancer is constantly evolving. Um, the keys to properly managing these men involve uh, proper disease and patient risk stratification um, to guide their management options. We always encourage shared decision-making and the aims, overall aims is to improve survival and to maintain their quality of life. And I thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to any questions in the question and answer segment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Antoine. You know, Dr. Antoine is a, has her postgraduate qualifications in DM neurology. Her special interests outside of medicine includes gardening, swimming and baking. So Dr. Antoine, we're expecting our share of baking over here. <laughs> and of course, as I said before, she is at Spanish Town Hospital. Thank you. Now we're joined by Rayan Robinson, the Senior Insurance Advisor at Guardian Life Limited, and he's also from Mandeville. Mr. Robinson, please go. Good morning. So it's, my name is Rayan Robinson, and I'm with Guardian Life Insurance Company. Um, I'm associated with the branch Mandeville. Now, Guardian Life is a 22 years old insurance company, though others may argue that we are over a hundred and had years. And they will say this on the basis that we would have bought out Mutual Life, Crown Eagle, Dials, among other insurance company that would have had uh, decades of experience. Now, we are a forced to reckon in the Caribbean region, and we stay to our promise and we fulfill our promises. Now, this morning I'm here to speak with you on the importance of life insurance. Now, why do you work? Why do we work? What is the most important factor in economic life? Do you agree that the reason we work and the most economic factor in life can be summed up into one word? income. We want a steady income that does not fluctuate and can be relied on. There are two main ways in which, or two sources in which we earn our income from, and that is you at work or your money at work. Now, there are hard situations that can affect the continuance of our income. Uh, this may be old age, disability, such as critical illness or, or debt. 
Now, this is what life insurance is really about. Life insurance create a reserve that replaces income which could be lost through disability or destroyed through debt or old age. But the good thing about life insurance is that it's a miracle. It is the only financial instrument known to man that works regardless of the time. If you have time like all other financial instruments, it accumulates money. However, unlike other financial instruments, if you don't have time, it creates money. Needs met by life insurance. Now, life insurance provides uh, family protection, saving investment, retirement, disability in terms of critical illnesses, collateral, business continuity, educational funding, and retirement. Now, in terms of family protection, now, when the breadwinner in a family dies, that doesn't mean that the responsibility that the family would have faced uh, come to an halt. No, uh, life continues. Therefore, bills will still have to be paid. And so by virtue of the breadwinner having a life insurance policy in place, what this person is actually saying to the rest of the family members are those who rely on him or her is that even in debt, I care. As a matter of fact, it can be the best love letter that a man or a woman could ever write to his or her, or her family. You know, on the side of disability and critical illness. Now, as our specialists would have just mentioned, the cost of uh, cancer, it can be very costly. And, and so when these things happen and there are not plans in place to deal with them financial wise, it can be so much of a burden. Now, what we tend to do over and decide is to provide persons with the relevant instrument that will provide you with the necessary financial backing that is needed in time of, of this uh, situation. Now, there are times when these things may happen and you would have had other objective or plans. And when this happened, it derailed those. Now, by virtue of you having a program with us, what it will do is that it will relieve you of such responsibility. So you can focus on your treatment because we stand ready to provide you with necessary financial support that is needed. Business continuity, you may be in a business, the business is going on well, uh, you probably would have taken out loan and so forth. However, uh, debt show up itself and the business have debts that need to be taken care of. By virtue of you having a life insurance policy, then this policy will definitely take care of those debts. And so the business can continue in a normal uh, way as possible. In terms of investment, a uh, person would have, have like long-term, medium to long-term goals or objective, be it whether you want to buy a car, a home, a piece of land, or at some point in time, start a business. Now, hold on this side, what we do is that we, we provide you with the relevant instrument that will help you to amass the necessary uh, resource or, or startup capital that will be needed to execute such a plan. We cannot leave out retirement. Uh, one would have over a period in time developed a certain lifestyle and then you would have become accustomed to that lifestyle. And so getting down into old age or retirement because persons retire at different age, then you would want to at least try to maintain or sustain that lifestyle as best as possible. And, and so in order for that to be a reality, you need to have the, the relevant funding to back that. And so we realize that need. And so in terms of life insurance, we have programs or instruments that will assist you along that journey to make it a relaxing retirement. Or can we forget education? I know it's the, the, the hope or the dream of our uh, um, parents, I, 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 I would say, that want to see is our her child or children, you know, uh, go through tertiary education. And, 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 and we can agree that in this time, education is really expensive. And so because we understand that uh, through life insurance program, uh, there are, there are instruments that uh, can be structured to assist the, the parents, uh, our, our, guidance, our, our guardians, uh, when that time comes. 
to provide them with relevant funding to make life a little more bearable or manageable in that uh, venture. Now, as it relates to collateral, oftentimes persons would want to uh, take out a mortgage or stuff like that. The financial institution, they want to know that in the event of debt, that their money is readily available. And life insurance is the only uh, uh, medium that would provide you that liquid immediately. And so we uh, provide life insurance that takes care of that also. Final expense in the event of death, then um, sometimes you would have gone to funeral and you would have seen where persons would have um, their uh, crying. Sometimes they are crying because they moan their, that they miss their loved ones. But sometimes they are crying because when they look at the financial standing that the family you now you know, have to face, and Peter was the main source of, of income, you now all hell broke loose. And so life insurance can give you a peace of mind in that regards. Who need life insurance? The young and single adult need life insurance. People who support a family or have, in the, uh, or have dependents. People who have loans or, or expenses. People with major goals uh, to achieve. Parents to secure the future of their children. Uh, business owners or persons who need their pension. These are some of the persons who need life insurance. And then it begs the question, how much coverage do you need? Now, there are certain factors that you'll have to take into consideration as it relates to how much coverage you need, the level of indebtedness that uh, may occur, uh, the disposable income of the individual, the needs that you have, the income, which is the human life value, or the value of your asset. What will be the cost? Now, the cost the cost it varies uh the, 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 the your age uh, your sex beat males or female uh your, your habit or lifestyle whether or not you're a smoker or not or uh, your medical uh, condition too so these are some of the factors that will dictate the cost of your life insurance uh, policy when is it a good time to get your life insurance today right now is the good time now is the best time the younger you are the cheaper it is the less uh, expensive the premium will be. Life-changing events such as getting married, having children, buying a home, or starting a business are usually opportune time to buy life insurance. With life insurance, business, because your family worked it, get your life insurance. Dealing with debt, tax saving purposes, supplement your retirement goals, help achieve long-term goals, peace of mind, create a source of savings, taking care of loved ones. How do you proceed? An appointment will be scheduled with you to get to know you better and the needs you may have for life insurance. A total need analysis will be done to identify gaps in your current portfolio. Recommendation will be made on the product best suit to your unique situation for your review and decision. Take decision as serious one. Insurance is important, so take care in choosing. The time may be running out, Set an appointment today. You may be, we, we may be reached on uh, 9628180 or 5795296. Any questions? I will be available in the question and answer uh, slot that is available. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. We are now joined. By our guest presenter, Dr. Jose Arturo Rodriguez Rivera. He's a graduate of medicine, surgeon, and midwives at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Guadalajara. He's a graduate of the residence of urology and course assistant university. Graduate of the residence of urology and course assistant, course assistant university graduate, School of Guadalajara, February 1988. Chief of Urology at the Hospital General de Occidente, Health Security, Health Secretary of State, I'm translating some of this as well, I'm sorry. Government from Jalisco, the 1st March 1989 until February 2019. Certificate of Mexican National Council of Urology, October 1988. Recertification, December 2021. He was recerti recertified six times in the National Council of Urologists, effective until the year 2026. He has taught of the Chair of Urology Postgraduate Student, Graduate School, University of Guadalajara, 
since 1991 until July 2019. He's a part-time teacher of the Matter of Urology, undergraduate faculty of medicine, University Autonoma de Guadalajara since 1998. He has written 37 theses, he has publications in the national and international journals, and he has eight international and six national association membership. Honorary member, American Urological Association, South Central Section, American Uro Urological Association, Endo Urological International Society, International Society for Sexual and Impotence Research, American Federation of Urology, Latin American Society for the Study of the Changes and Sexual Impotence, and nationally he has the Mexican Society of Urology, Mexican. Mexican Council of Urology, Mexican College of Urology, College Jalisco Urologist, AC founding partner, Mexican Association of Endourology, and Laparoscopy Lithotripsy. So Dr. Jose will speak to us about chemotherapy in the management of prostate cancer. Welcome, Dr. Jose, let us begin. Good morning. Thank you for the Jamaica Cancer Society to invite me for this talk regarding G the GNRH antagonists for the treatment of prostatic cancer. These are my disclosures. The objectives of this talk is demonstrate the efficacy benefits of Degarelix compared to LHRH agonist with a faster castation start and PSA suppression, a higher overall survival, the time for castration resistance, particularly in those with a high risk of progression, the significant decrease in cardiovascular and metabolic complication. And I'm going to describe the favorable safety profile of the Garelix compared to LHRH agonist, improvement in the control of bone metastasis, the minor events related to skeletal and urinary tract disease, and significantly lower cardiovascular events. Some of the difference, uh, very important difference, is the change in the chain. The chain for the GNRH uh, have a, 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 a one amount of amino acid in the, the agonist uh, uh, supply one amino acid for another. In the case of the antagonist, they change more than four uh, amino acids, and these chains make some difference, like a longer specific receptor binding time, greater affinity of receptor binding, high selectivity in receptor binding, blocking action with a biological activity to stimulate, and not existence of the flare effect, therefore with a need for concomitant antiandrogens in the, in the patient. Uh, both uh, agonists and antagonists share the same receptor. The mechanisms of action are very different. The agonists stimulate the receptor, generating an initial increase in an LH, FH, and testosterone. Antagonists block the receptor immediately, inhibiting FH, LH, and testosterone. This produce that the peak in FH, the agonists produce peak in FSH, LH, and testosterone after suppression, produce micro peaks in LH and testosterone after repetitive injection, and FSA, FSH suppression was not maintained in the long term. On the other hand, antagonists had immediate suppression of SH, LH, and testosterone without micro peaks and prolonged prolonged suppression of SH, LH, and testosterone. In this chart, it's possible to note this big difference. In the case of orchiectomy, decrease all of the hormones. In the case of the agonist, initially increase all the hormones, then decrease this, but FSH, after the decrease, increase again. This is the big difference with the antagonist. The antagonist never increase the hormones and only decrease uh, all the hormones and uh, maintain the decrease in FSH. I'm going to talk some regarding the importance of this FSH decreation along the time. The first publication regarding the efficacy and safety of Degarelix in a one year in patients treated with Degarelix or one leoprolite note a big difference in the effect of testosterone flare effect. Leprolite had increased in the testosterone and this increase produced a flare effect. On the other hand, the 
they got relics at the day one, decreased testosterone in one 52%. On day three, the decreases 87%. On the day seven, the decreases had the amount of 99%. In the case of the Garelix, the Garelix decreased the, tes the testosterone until day 14, but he needed one month in order to maintain the same decrease in the testosterone level like a uh, Degarelix. This quick suppression of testosterone and without peaks is with Degarelix, but in the case of Leprolite, testosterone and micro peaks after the nine injection appears in the 4% of the patient over 0.25 NJ and in 2% of the patients with 0.5 NG with the treated with, with Leprolite. This effect is not present in patients with Degarelix, and this has effects in the uh, prostate cancer. The significant reduction of the major PSA with Degarelix with Leprolite. Check here on the day seven, we have a statistical significant the decrease in the PSA. Did maintain the decrease until day 28. At the end of the 56 days, the decrease in the a PSA is very important. And this is the time that Leoplite needs to decrease the, the, the PSA at the same amount as the Garelix. The P of these uh, effects is very different and significantly statistic with uh, Leoplite and the Garelix. Uh, the other important uh, part of these uh, decreases as the effect that the, the Garelix and uh, Leoplite plus antiandrogens had in the phosphatase alkaline. The uh, phosphatase alkaline is increased with agonist, with agonist plus antiandrogens. Then on the second month, decrease, but on the month six, it's possible to increase again. After that, decrease, but it's possible to have some increases on phosphatase al alkaline along the time. This is not the same with the, uh, the garelix. The management uh, had little increase in the first month, but decreased along the time. Uh, after the first revision of the results of this study, they have a second analysis. And in this second analysis, they compare the men's that uh, at the baseline had a PSA level over 20, between 20 and 50. And the decrease on PSA progression is most important in the arm on the Garelix compared with Leoprolite. If the patient had basal PSA over 50, this uh, decrease in the PSA progression is more important again with, in the case of the Garelix compared with Leoprolite. With these results, uh, is we note at the end of the second revision that uh, Degarelix reduced significantly, significantly risk of PSA progression. I talk in regard to castrating, castrating resistant or death in comparison with death with a P of 0.05 versus Leoprolite at the end of the study. And if the probability of failure in the free time is more important from the Garelix. The Degarelix had less failure than Leoprolite at the end of the year of the study in this uh, uh, revision. And the Garelix improves objectives versus agonists more antiandrogens. The, uh, the answer for PSA progression free with the Garelix is better than with the agonist plus uh, alpha uh, antiandrogens. Uh, Dr. David Crawford performed a one, five years uh, prolongation of this study with a crossover. This is a crossover. After one year of treatment with le le Leoprolite, the patients in Leoprolite cross over the Garelix. And check what happens. The, this line, this is decreased progressively, st stop to decrease and maintaining horizontally at the, demand, at the month 26 are the same results in the control of the PSA than in the arm of the Garelix that start the Garelix 
at the start of the study. This is uh, another very important thing because we, uh, for us, it's possible to start the treatment with some agonies, but after the time, it's possible to cross over uh, uh, to receive antagonists, the Garayalix. The progression free survival in patients with baseline PSA levels over 20 is the same. The decrease in the probability of uh, the increase in the probability of uh, uh, progression is uh, progressively and then stabilized after the change from uh, Leoprolite to the Garelix. In summary, for these studies, the CS21 and CS21A compared the therapy with the agonist. The Garelix offers more rapid castration start and PSA suppression with a risk of clinical flare, no peaks or micro peaks during treatment, higher overall survival, especially in those with a higher risk of progression. Uh, PSA patient with PSA uh, on best lane over 20. And in five years of treatment with the the progression free survival in relation to PSA is improved after crossover of leprolite to the Garelix, and the therapy was well tolerated. On October, 27, 20, 27 uh, around 23,000 patients significantly increased cardiovascular morbidity. And uh, Dr. Christopher Seigal said for, that for men with metastatic disease, focusing on reduced cardiac risk factor to exercise the use of lipid lowering can mitigate some risk of the antiandrogen therapy. Dr. Tsai, in the same year, uh, take, talking about five, almost 5,000 patients with localized prostate cancer, if there are a positive association between antiandrogen therapy and the risk of death due to cardiovascular complications in patients with localized cancer. Two years more, Dr. Keating in the National Cancer Institute uh, talking regarding 37,500 patients in the Veterans Center in the United States diagnosed with prostate cancer. The comparison agonies with antandrogen, there are direct relationship between the GNRH agonies and increase of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Smith, two years more, uh, participate in 1,700 men in nine different clinical trials. The Garelix were received for an average of 22 months. The cardiovascular disease criteria like ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disorders, arterial thrombotic or embolic, and intermittent claudication for peripheral arteriovascular pathology, he notes an increase in cardiovascular risk was not observed with a similar risk rate before and after the administration of the Garelix. With the results, the FDA sent at the manufacturers of the agonist of the need to add new safety information in the warnings and precautions section on drug levels. This new information warned of the increased risk of diabetes and certain cardiovascular disease like a myocardial infarction, sudden cardiac stroke in men treated with a medication for the treatment of prostatic cancer. This warning does not include GNRH antagonists. Uh, in the clinical studies of phase three, the K benefits of the Garelix have been reported in phase three clinical studies. The joint information from multiple studies allows a robust analysis of results of a large patient population. The database in clinical studies with the Garelix has been analyzed comparing disease control parameters, the suppression of PSA, side effects related to disease, musculoskeletal and urinary tract events, cardiovascular risk events, comparing treatments with Degarelix versus agonists and agonists without, with or without antiandrogens. And the cost regression analysis can be used to adjust any covariance factors, adjusted for age, the state of the prostatic cancer, baseline PSA and testosterone. The better progression free survival in relation with the PSA with the Garelix versus analogs was uh, founded in this uh, revision of this, uh, all these studies 
along the first year of treatment. I had superior global survival with Degan LX versus LH RH analogous in all the patients treated, and lower probability of muscle events in Degan LX versus the analogous in all the patients in all the clinical studies. The probability of seeing of symptoms related to problem problems are less in the arm on the garelix than in the arm or agonist, and the fracture probability is more in the case of the treatment with agonist compared with the patient treated with the garelix. Uh, the garelix versus analogous trials the, checking for the symptoms and prostate size, and these three studies, the CS28, CS30, and CS31, comparing the garelix with gosselinba versus becalotamide in the time of 12 weeks in all these studies. The primary outcome was the international prostate score symptoms, the, the prostate volume. And in all these studies, he notes a very improved in the IPP, IPSS, the volume of the prostate is better for the arm with the garelix comparing with the arm with uh, analogs. This is the control in the uh, urinary tract symptoms. The lower urinary tract symptoms note the difference, the P is significantly significant in the decrease of the symptoms, the, the lower urinary tract when the patient is treated with the garelix compared with analogs. It's the same in the uh, IPP, IPSS score less more than 13 and in the patient with the, and this other study. In this, in this last study, we know that the P is more significantly than in the other one. When all, all, in all the cases, the patient with we treated with the Garelix obtains more control of the lower urinary tract symptoms compared with the patient treated with analog, with analog plus antiandrogen. There are lower probability of lower urinary tract events with the garelix and analogous. This is the chart, and I found the P is very significant, the big difference in the probability of lower urinary tract events comparing both arms of these all studies. And injection therapy and cardiovascular risk was analyzed in, same, in many studies. The, uh, the ADT is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. The LHRH agonist is associated with increased cardiovascular morbidity compared to orchectomy. Men with a history of cardiovascular disease had a higher risk. The garelix has a different mechanism of action from LH analogs, and the risk of cardiovascular events might therefore differ between these two therapies. The risk of cardiovascular events in men receiving LHRH analogs or the garelix was assessed in single disease analysis on phase three clinical studies. This is the publication for Dr. Albertsen and Dr. Lawrence Klotz. And uh, this is the six studies that they use comparing leoprolide or gosrelin for uh, this patient. The measurements in these studies was analysis based on death from any cause of cardiac event. The definition of cardiac events was embolic or thrombotic arterial event, hemorrhage of cerebrovascular ischemia, myocardial infection, ischemic heart disease. The risk of cardiovascular events or death in the global population had a P that is not static and more significant, but it's different, it's different between agonists with the, and against the garelix. The risk of cardiovascular event or death in population with prior history of cardiovascular disease is more higher in the patient with agonists comparing con the garelix. You know, if I return to the other chart, chair, the line for the, the garelix is only little increase in the case of patient with the story of cardiovascular, but it's very different in the case of the patient treated with the agonist. The higher event of cardiovascular is very different. Check here, any event in the case of the garelix 2.8%, in the case of agonist, 4.4. The uh, possibility of death is 1.3 in the case of the garelix, 2.6 in the case of the patient treated with agonist. 
what happened if the patient had history of cardiovascular uh, uh, events? Check. Increase the risk of uh, any cardiovascular event in both arms, but check the difference. Only 2.8 versus 4.5, almost a double. But in the case of agonies, it's almost three times more. Check. Okay. And the opportunity for death is almost the same in the case of the patient without or with history of cardiovascular disease, and very different in the case of the patient with uh, no history and yes history of cardiovascular. This, this is the big risk when the treatment the, with uh, at the patient with agonists comparing with the antagonists. Uh, what is the hypothesis of this? The hypothesis are the metabolic syndrome has a higher implication. It includes in the less of its expression three of the following events. Central obesity, the accumulation of abdominal fat, elevation of blood pressure, impaired fasting glucose, elevated plasma triglycerides and decreased plasma levels of high cholesterol density. The elevation of cardiovascular risk is recognized by the influence of metabolic syndrome the ADT promotes insulin resistance as well as the accumulation of subcutaneous fat and loss of muscle mass, and added uh, the sufficient cause of the lack of testosterone. Check here in this chart all the changes that is possible to find regarding the increase of the adipocyte size and numbers. This increased insulin resistance, increased estradiol, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin 6 and leptins. All of them acts increasing the deposit tissue and the intake, uh, the uptake of triglycerides. All of them had direct impact because the plate stability is very different in the patient with a little amount of lipid accumulation and in the vulnerable, vulnerable plate increased the lipid accumulation. In the case of the stable plate, the layer is thicker is rich in collagen, the lipids are low, and the inflammatory status is less. In the case of vulnerable plate, the layer is thin, the composition is rich in inflammatory cells of proteolytic activity, the lipids are high, and there are more inflammation. This is the result of the increase of all the metabolic alteration in the patient. Another role is very important, the T lymphocyte. There are a key cells in collagen metabolism and therefore have an effect on plague. They stimulate macrophages, then they release protease, proteases and they degrade the collagen matrix or the fibrosis of the plague, increase the risk of thromboembolic complications. This is a stimulation of the T lymphocytes in the uh, agonists and with the antagonists. In the case of the agonists, the T cells was stimulated increase their activity and proliferation, and it's possible to produce fracture of the fibrotic layer and, play, and plague in instability. In the case of the agonists, they don't stimulate the cells for, is not increased on proliferation activation. The plate is stable, is maintained all the time. How T-lymphocyte intervene? The stimulation of T-lymphocyte be the agonist to be linked to the GN receptor. Right, the production in, in uh, interferon gamma, inhibition, inhibition the collagen synthesis, the CD40L, this is collagenase over regulation, all changes, two changes, produce alteration in the fibrotic layer and plaque instability, the increased risk of thromboembolic complication in the patient. In this publication, Dr. Hopmans check the association with the the antagonists associated with less adiposity and reduced characteristic of metabolic syndrome and atherosclerosis compared orchectomy and agonist in the preclinical mouse model. And he note when the patient was untreated, if the patient is treated, the, the mouse is treated untreated, if the mouse is treated with the garelix, if the uh, mouse is treated with agonist leprolyte, check the difference in the vascular plagues in this uh, most models. Dr. <coughs> Knudson uh, have another study, another the effect of the GN, GNRH 
in the and the macrophages in the and the is his receptor is expressed in atherosclerotic pallex. Uh, I'm talking with you that uh, I'm going to mention something regarding the FSH inhibition and the biological surplus value. The tumor cells have expression in FSH receptors. FSH receptors are in the luminal wall of the solid tumor vessels. These receptors are in glandular epithelium, healthy tissue, hyperplastic or neoplastic tissue, is susceptible to stimulation and the possible influence on cell multiplication. The innovation, the, remember this uh, uh, chart, is decreased with the, the garelix, is decreased with leoprolite. When the patient change from leoprolite to the garelix, check the reduction, the inhibition of FSA is very effective. 98% with the agonist versus 51 with the agonist in this point. The castration resistant tumor cells express biological active FSA receptors on their surface. Experimental results have shown that the answer is cell multiplication. FSA receptors in the luminal wall of blood vessel of solid tumors. The receptor have been localized in the glandular epithelium and prostate tissue with BPH and with prostatic cancer. It is selectively expressed in the endothelium vessel on a wide range of tumors. They participate in tumor angiogenesis in two ways, vascular growth factors and GQ11 mechanic that activates BAGFR2. A role of chemical mediator in the molecular signaling of the tumor cells is suggested and is therefore a new therapeutic target in the management of PCI. It has been shown that the FSA levels can be subject to gradual control with currently available pharmacological option which are as <clears throat> antagonists of the GNRH. This is the expression of the receptor of the FSH <clears throat> on the FSH receptors. The normal prostate has plus, BPH has plus two, prostate cancer plus three, and prostate cancer castration resistant plus four. Also, it is the presence of FSH and FSH receptors in adipocytes and in cardiac myocytes. The ADT and severe resist conclusion. The garelic treatment compared to LH agonists in patients with pre existing cardiovascular disease provides significantly fewer cardiovascular events during the first year of treatment, relative risk reduction more than 56%, and absolute risk reduction of 8.2%. Lower risk of cardiovascular events or death in men with or without pre existing cardiovascular disease. The risk of cardiac events suspended during the one year of therapy, significantly fewer men with uh, antagonists versus agonists are affected by cardiovascular risk on uh, RR0.002. The treatment administrator first option before the main treatment that usually consists of surgery. Examples of adjuvant, thera adjuvant therapy include chemother chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and hormonal therapy in the tumor volume reduction, reduce the fields of radiate, reduce the adverse event, reduce the incidence of positive margins, organ, lim organ limitation and lift of the infiltration as sensitive sites, the cancer cells. Simultaneous administration of hormonal treatment and radiotherapy session in the, in the study, Europe, the European study in 4,000 uh, patients uh, of anisological grade, note the difference in the patient treated with the combination of radiotherapy with uh, only radiation at the 10 years uh, progression free survival is better for the treated patient treated with the combination. And the cumulative 10 year mortality rate is different with the patient only radiation versus the patient treated with radiation plus ADT. Additional supportive treatment administered after primary treatment to reduce the risk of disease concurrence. Adjuvant therapy might include chemotherapy, radiation therapy, hormonal therapy, immunotherapy, or biological therapy. With improvement of GS, early chemotherapy is better, and the addition now to the new antiandrogens, ensalutamide or abiraterone. In the charter study, men with advanced disease with higher tumor volume defined as a four or more bone metastasis or visceral metastasis, seven 
almost 800 patients, size cycles of Doxetaxel 75 mg every three weeks with an ADT versus ADT eyeliner only. Improved in 70 months of overall survival is very significant. The PSA response improved. The clinical progression time is less in the patient treated with the combination, and the time to recurrence is um, longer in the patient treated with the combination. If we check the NCCN guidelines, the last publication of this year, note that all the risk groups, the ADT is one indication. Not here, it's one indication. In the patient with lower risk group, ADT is one option. In the patient with in, uh, favorable intermediate risk group, ADT is very important option. In the unfavorable intermediate risk group, ADT is one of the first option for all of these patients. And in the patient with high or very high risk group, sorry, ADT is very important. And uh, it's not necessary to remember you, but when I start ADT in any patient with prostatic cancer, we need to maintain the ADT suppression along the time. If the heart, a patient had progression of the disease, progression of the PSA or metastasis, we need to maintain the ADT and add another kind of treatment like uh, uh, antiandrogens, uh, or the second or third generation, the new immunotherapies or the addition or another new therapies. And check in all risk and any regional risk group, the ADT is preferred over other, other treatments. In conclusion, the Garalex treatment compared to agonists in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, significantly fewer cardiovascular events during, during the first year of treatment relative risk reduction plus per 50%, GNR antagonists appears to suspend the numbers of cardiac events in men with cardiovascular disease during the first year of treatment compared with the agonists. Faster castrationization and PSA suppression with a risk of clinical flare effect, higher PSA progression-free survival, castration or their resistant time, especially in a higher risk of progression patient with PSA basal over 20, best overall survival, better control of skeletal metastasis, fewer events related to musculoskeletal and lower urinary tract disease, and significant, significantly lower cardiovascular events during the first year of treatment with the antagonists, comparing with the agonists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Excellent presentation. We now have a presentation from Medical Products Limited. Pleasant greetings, everyone. My name is April Marshall, Senior Medical Representative at Medical Products Limited. And before I begin my presentation today, I would first like to extend gratitude to the Jamaica Cancer Society for hosting today's symposium. And indeed, on behalf of Medical Products Limited, it is a pleasure to be on board as one of the sponsors for today's event. For today's presentation, I will begin to highlight WEPOX. WEPOX is human recombinant erythropoietin, 4,000 IU, prefill syringes. Now, anemia in men with advanced prostate cancer, of course, we know is pretty much a complex process. And anemia in men with advanced prostate cancer may be caused by several factors. These factors may include androgen deprivation, treatment-related toxicities, and even nutritional decline. In men, castration is known to be a well-documented cause of anemia, along with hematuriots. And in the fact that the normal bone marrow tends to be replaced with cancer cells, it also causes or rather can contribute to anemia in men with prostate cancer. Therefore, along with blood transfusions, treatment with a human recombinant erythropoietin are considerable treatment measures. And it can also be said, whereas in a study by Shamdas, um, basically, 28% of men with metastatic prostate cancer have anemia. 
So in your patients who have androgen independent prostate cancer and anemia, a recombinant human erythropoietin therapy at perhaps a median dose of 150 units per kilogram subcutaneously three times a week definitely increased hemoglobin concentration by more than 10%, which is to note is a major benefit that therefore reduces in a decrease of transfusion requirements and, of course, is an improvement in the quality of life for your patients. Wepox is available at Medical Products Limited, and we do supply your local hospitals with Wepox. And that brings me to my second product for today, which is Cutinox. Now, a venous thromboembolism in cancer patients is associated with increased mortality and morbidity. And cancer patients are at a six to seven fold increased risk of a venous thromboembolism. Therefore, adequate management of a VTE is of utmost importance for clinicians involved in the care of cancer patients. Now, Cutinox presents as 20, 40, 60, and 80 milligram pre-filled syringes. Cutinox can be found island-wide in both the public and private sectors. Cutinox is also available within of your private pharmacies for purchase by patients. And Medical Products Limited is the sole distributor of Cutinox island-wide. And with that said, my two key product reminders, Wepox, which is your human recombinant erythropoietin, and Cutinox, low molecular weight heparin. I thank you all for tuning into uh, my presentation for today, and I wish you the very best for the rest of today's event. Thank you very much. We are now joined by Dr. Rayad Gafour, president of the Jamaica Urological Society. Dr. Gafour is a urologist who is dedicated to benign and malignant diseases, with specialized expertise in minimally invasive surgery, urinary stone disease, and renal transplantation. transplantation sorry. Presently, he's a consultant surgeon with private practice. He's also employed to the Kingston Public Hospital. He graduated the University of the West Indies, Mona, where he attended medical school, MBBS 2001, and further specialized in neurology of Doctorate of Medicine 2013. He attended the McMaster University and the University of Toronto for elective training during his residency. Dr. Gafour then subspecialized with fellowship training in minimally invasive surgery, neuro-oncology, and stone disease as a well-received and honorary appointment in renal transplant surgery at Monash Health Services in Melbourne, Australia, 2014 to 2016. Dr. Gafour is a member of the American Neurological, Neurological Association, Societe Internationale de Neurology, and the European Association of Urology, and is the president of the Jamaican Neurological Society. He is managing director of the Elective Surgical Center, Art of Surgery, He's an avid tennis player and gardener, but his greatest achievement to date is being a father. Thank you, Dr. Gafour. We will now present on surgery in the management of prostate cancer. Good day. I'm excited to talk to you today about the role of surgery in prostate cancer. That is how, when, and why do we use radical prostatectomy in the contemporary setting in the treatment of prostate cancer. I wanna thank the board and team members of the Jamaica Cancer Society, my co-presenters and colleagues for making this important and relevant talk available. So his, these are the points that I'm gonna to want to cover. Um, historically, we've most, being been used in radical prostatectomy in the management of low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. Um, so I want to show that that evidence that there is a benefit of surgery. Um, more recently, we've been reserving um, surgery for intermediate and higher risk patients and offering active surveillance for those patients with low risk disease 
because of the fear of overtreating. That is, patients were unlikely to die from disease or develop metastatic disease. Um, those patients would not benefit from surgery. So is there actually a role for radical prostatectomy in these patients? Um, moving to the other side of the spectrum is surgery for patients with locally advanced disease. What is the benefit of surgery for these patients? And taking it another step further, what about the patients with low volume metastatic disease? And then finally, I want to look at the different modalities of surgical intervention or radical prostatectomy. So just to make sure that we're all starting on the same page, I'm sure my previous presenters would have covered this, but the NCCN guidelines um, for risk stratification are low, intermediate, and high. And for the low risk as patients with PSA less than 10 and Gleason score of six with non-palpable or um, one small uh, lesion that's palpable on the prostate. Intermediate is PSA 10 to 20 with a Gleason of seven. And the high risk disease patients have at least a mnemovesical invasion, PSA of 20 and higher and a Gleason of eight, nine or 10. So um, the studies have shown uh, that there is a benefit to offering surgery to low and intermediate risk patients. And depending on which study you want to look at, there are different cancer-specific survival rates that are quoted, as some as high as 98% um, at 10 years, 90%, 86%. And uh, similarly, progression-free uh, rates um, progression free from recurrence rates of 68 and metastatic free recurrence rates of 84%. So these are all very encouraging numbers um, for the low and intermediate risk patient. And if you look at the studies in detail, so there's a pivot study um, by Wilt et al. that randomized men to surgery or watchful waiting. And this is in a non screen population, and they all had localized prostate cancer. The endpoint was all-cause mortality, and secondary endpoint was cancer-specific mortality. And at 15 years, there's no significant difference between the two arms, between those patients who were operated on and those patients who were observed. But when you look at the subgroup analysis, when you, sub, when you separate low, intermediate, and high-risk patients, you begin to see a difference. For the low-risk patients, the chance of dying from prostate cancer was about one in a hundred. So most patients who had low risk, it was safe to observe them. And you see that in the chart um, here with a trend towards observation. Whereas for intermediate risk, you start to see a separation, roughly 33% risk reduction in overall mortality for these patients with intermediate risk. And for the high risk patients who are twice as likely to die from prostate cancer if you're observed and if you were offered intervention. And in addition, the um, bone rate of bony metastasis was lower in the radical prostatectomy group. So again, you see in the subgroup analysis, the trend towards um, uh, observation for the low risk patients, but intervention for the intermediate and high risk. And what's interesting in this study is that the death from other cause rate was 40%, which is much higher than what you would expect in contemporary studies, which generally would be around a 7% rate. So we can probably deduct that pivot does not represent a, a great or a current cohort of patients that we would choose. The demographics would not reflect what we would look at today and consider good patient selection. So a lot of these patients were uh, older and had multiple comorbidities and may not have benefited from surgery in any case. So probably you'd seen, would have seen a greater divergence in the treatment effect versus watchful waiting arm. The PROTECT trial is a more recent and larger randomized study um, following patients up to 10 years and the randomized patients to active surveillance, surgery or radiation, the primary outcome was cancer specific mortality. And again, we see no significant difference between the groups when you look at all risk groups. If interest, almost three quarters of patients had 
low risk disease. So um, when you look at the metastases and progression, it was more common in the active surveillance group. This is actually active monitoring and these the protocols that we use today for active surveillance were not as stringent then. So it is possible that and likely and what we actually see that our active surveillance cohorts in contemporary studies have very low metastatic rates and progression rates. Nonetheless, um, what we can take from the PROTECT trial is that the number needed to treat uh, to avoid one patient from having metastatic disease was 27 for surgery and 37 for radiation. And the number needed to treat to avoid one patient developing clinical progression was nine for both intervention arms, which is very um, uh, encouraging indeed for intervention. So is there anyone at all that you should offer surgery to who has low risk disease? Well, the rationale is that surgery offers excellent cure rates over 90 to 95% with no chance of recurrence when they are operated on or they get radiation. And that's biochemical or clinical recurrence. And it's not really a radical surgery because we rarely would do a lymph node dissection as their chance of lymph node disease is less than 1%. So there's a decreased complication rates in terms of lymphocele and shorter surgeries. The follow-up is less complicated and there's no imaging or rebiopsy needed and the chances of adjuvant therapy is rare. However, there's still the chance of, or the fear of over-treatment for those patients. And so traditionally, or uh, more recently, we offer them active surveillance. Um, but who can we offer surgery to in the low risk group without overtreating? So if we look at SPCG4 trial that was published in 2005 in New England Journal, um, where almost 700 men were randomized to surgery versus watchful waiting. And um, their life expectancy was greater than 10 years. So a very good cohort of patients. Primary endpoint was death from any cause. And um, when we sub-analyze a group of men who were younger than 65 years of age and fall into 18 years, um, you see a benefit, a significant benefit and reduction in relative risk of death from any cause for the interventional group, those who had surgery. Um, and also for the risk of development of distant metastases, or say almost 60% less likely to develop mets if you had surgery for this cohort. And another armament in our, um, or rather not another bullet in our armament to determine who is truly low risk is the use of genomic. So we've got these genomic risk scores, decipher and oncotype and Prolaris. And what they do is they look at um, the uh, several genes, the most common being the DNA damage response genes, um, in particular BRCA1 and 2, the ATM, CHEX2, and HOBOX. And men who have these genes are as high as three times increased risk of uh, upgrading on their pathology in 10 years. So these men tend to harbor more aggressive disease and higher chance of metastasis and recurrent diseases. So if you um, submit to a genomic test, and you're deemed high risk, then you probably would not be a great candidate for active surveillance. So another decision-making tool that we have in determining who to offer surgery to. So on the other end of the spectrum is a men with high-risk disease, and are we under-treating these men? So those are men with PSAs of greater than 20 and um, seminal vesicle invasion, as we said, Gleason 8, 9, and 10. And historically, these men have been managed with monotherapy um, in terms of systemic androgen deprivation therapy, which is a non-curative approach. And the capture database is observational, but it still confirms our fear that most men with high-risk disease are being treated with systemic non-curative therapy alone. And the reason for not offering surgery is the fear of having a positive surgical margin and the presence of micrometastatic disease. In other words, you would do the surgery and the patient would still be at risk for recurrence or inadequate disease control. So they would face the risks of complication without the benefit of cure. Um, however, what 
the latest results are showing or the strongest results are showing is that there is certainly a chance at cure for these men with high risk disease. And you can see that there is a biochemical free survival rate of almost 50% at 10 years um, in this subset of men. That must be taken with a grain of salt because as you increase the number of risk factors, you decrease the biochemical recurrence rate free survival um, with each additional factor. In other words, a diminishing returns. The more high risk factors, the more likely that you have biochemical recurrence. Having said that, almost one third of patients um, will never need another modality of treatment, another adjuvant treatment. So they all end up getting um, no multimodality treatment. And as such, they're spared side effects of radiation and systemic antigen treatment. Um, so when you compare that to radiation, almost all men who have high-risk disease will routinely get three years of antigen deprivation therapy with the metabolic side, uh, side effects and um, with the systemic side effects or risks of cardiovascular events and so on that we know happens with antigen de deprivation therapy. The second rationale for offering surgery to high-risk patients is you prevent clinical complications, um, in particular, um, the complications associated with uh, local spread of disease. So hematuria, blood outlet obstruction, and eventually um, renal deterioration from upper tract obstruction. And the, when you look at the complication rate of surgery versus radiation, um, NAM and CLOT at, at all um, did a significant study in, in Sunnybrook um, in Toronto that showed that your chances of admission after surgery versus radiation um, was twice as high after radiation. And this is for urological and rectal procedures. So management of rectal fistulas, hematuria after radiation. Um, those patients needing open surgery and secondary development of secondary cancers was twice as high after radiation. And so we were not ex including complications associated with erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence. It was all other complications. The third um, rationale for offering surgery is the significant downstaging that we see on final pathology. So roughly 44% of patients initially thought to have T3 disease ended up having T2 disease on final pathology. So if we excluded them off the bat, a good number of patients would not have been offered surgery and would have been excluded and therefore had lost their chance at curability. And what we know is that once you have um, specimen uh, confined disease, your chance of um, cancer specific survival is very high, seen on the left uh, graph here, and your chance of biochemical recurrence is equally high compared to if you have none specimen confined disease. So certainly a benefit if you end up having T2 disease rather than T3 disease. And um, you would again not have been offered surgery if um, all T3 patients were excluded. The fourth major argument for surgery in high-risk patients is that you get a histological specimen when you remove the prostate. And with the histology, we're able to assess patients who would be uh, good candidates for newer novel therapies like immunotherapies, uh, checkpoint inhibition, um, choosing chemotherapeutic agents, and so on. And for those who don't actually have systemic disease, they would have been spared, again, the metabolic and uh, side effects of androgen deprivation and cardiovascular side effects and so on. And the data sort of um, uh, uh, supports what we are saying. Again, retrospective study, which is prone to selection biases, but still the meta-analysis would show that surgery um, has an improved overall survival and cancer-specific survival. And there are some prospective studies that are coming out for the high-risk patients, and we await those studies. Realistically, you know, these patients are subject to um, more uh, um, aggressive surgeries because they probably have or have a higher chance of exocapsular disease 
T3 disease, seminal vesicle invasion, positive margin. So surgeons tend to be a bit more aggressive with um, the neurovascular bundle, and they're at higher risk for incontinence and impotence as a result. But there are certain things, new novel um, approaches that we can utilize today, such as frozen section um, to assess whether we need to sacrifice neurovascular bundle is your chance of positive margin here and 3D pre-op MRI reconstructions to help aid um, whether we can do an inter or intrafascial dissection. Again, all uh, means of, sac of sparing the neurovascular bundle where possible. And when it has to be sacrificed, and we can offer patients nerve grafts um, to the resected neurovascular bundle with good outcome. Uh, taking the argument one step further, what about patients who have low volume uh, metastatic disease? So that would be patients who have uh, less than six metastatic sites on imaging. And the rationale for this is that in other cancers, in particular ovarian, colon, and kidney cancers, we've seen improvements by reducing the tumor burden by offering cytoreductive therapy. Um, and we do appreciate that this is likely part of multimodal therapy. So these, a lot of these patients will go on to need another form of therapy. But um, we think that by reducing the primary cancer burden, we're taking out the most aggressive cancers and reducing the source for further metastases. And in so doing also, um, we reduce the chance of local complications. Um, what we do see is that um, the local complication rate is decreased when you compare men who've had surgery versus radiation versus no treatment at all with um, accompanying quality of life benefit. And um, you can see here again that even though we're looking at observational databases, there is a, a trend in favor of surgery as there's a separation of the curve between radiation, systemic ther therapy and observation versus versus surgery. And again, we've got some high level um, studies, well-designed studies coming out from centers of excellence and the Anderson and so on. And we await their um, results where it comes to cytoreductive surgery. Uh, future trends to look at to help us determine who would be good uh, candidates is the use of PSMA PET CT. These, this leads to um, the identification of regional and uh, um, distant metastases um, and guiding our lymphadenectomy and how extensive it should be. Um, and whether lymphadenectomy, lymphadenectomy has a survival advantage is still probably questionable. It's still to be proven. Um, and again, we may have an increase in complication rates such as lymphocytes. So it's an exciting area to um, keep an eye on. Presently, it's still investigational, but um, I, for one, am excited to know, can we offer these patients surgery? Finally, I just wanna briefly touch on the various modalities of surgery. A lot of GPs and primary care physicians will call me and say, ask me, who should, who, who should I refer my patients to? Um, the, person, the surgeon who's doing open surgery, or the person who's doing laparoscopic or robotic surgery. And um, certainly robotics is becoming very common in the States. So nine out of 10 prostatectomies presently are being done robotically. And it's difficult to decipher this, the evidence being presented because it's mostly observational and there's significant heterogeneity in the techniques employed and selection bias in the patients that are selected, so probably smaller prostates and uh, less obese patients are getting radical prostatectomy uh, robotically. At the end of the day, um, we've presented on this before, there's no clear advantage uh, in the guidelines for, of one modality versus another. Um, if you look at the overall complication rate, there's no trend in significance to any modality. Um, the differences are non-significant. In operative time, certainly robotic um, prostatectomy tends to have an advantage, a significant advantage, and laparoscopic seems to be the uh, longest because it's technically it's very challenging 
whether this has any actual clinical implications for patient outcome, uh, the length of operative time is still to be determined. And the potency rates there certainly is a trend to um, benefit for the robotics um, uh, prostatectomy. And that was clinically significant, statistically significant. Um, there are a few randomized studies, as I said, to help guide us. This study by Yaxley um, randomized 326 men to surgery versus open surgery versus robotic. And again, the narrative is the same. It's hard to show any significant difference between the arms and the authors concluded, concluded that they encourage patients to choose an experienced surgeon rather than a specific surgical approach. So not to belabor the point, but what does seem to make a difference is the experience. Um, once you get to 250 prostatectomies, there is a, 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 a significant improvement in your um, recurrence rates, um, regardless of approach. Um, so again, the take home message is that experience is the surgeon's best asset. Um, having said that, you would think inherently that the um, Zoom um, view that you get with robotic surgery should lead to um, less uh, recurrence rates, less uh, mar uh, positive margins, and better preservation of the neurovascular bundle. Inherently, you would think that that would be. We, I certainly am awaiting the evidence that's going to corroborate this suspicion. Um, in conclusion, radical prostatectomy remains relevant in the treatment of um, prostate cancer, and we are seeing a migration towards um, treating more aggressive disease. Um, certainly, there is a benefit in a select subgroup of low-risk patients, in particular the lower the, the younger patient who may be exposed to the risk of malignant transformation and upgrading for longer. The role in um, oligometastatic disease is investigational, but the initial results are exciting. And the surgical approach is not as significant as the experience of the surgeon. The future discussion points would be um, the role of imaging, the PSMA PET scan in identifying um, who would be a candidate for salvage lymph node dissection um, or extended lymph node dissection. And very exciting is the use of genomics in selecting patients for active surveillance and um, patients who would benefit from intervention. So um, I hope that this generates some thoughts and some questions, and I hope that this has clarified um, a lot of areas of gray areas for persons, and I look forward to the question and answer section. Thank you for your time and for your, for your um, attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Gafour. So those persons who wish to get in touch with Dr. Gafour, you can reach him at Art of Surgery, 10 Ripon Road, Kingston 5, and his numbers are 960-8112, 906-1284, Nine zero six one two eight five, or info dot art of surgery ja at gmail dot com. We're now having Dr. Karen Pemberton, radiation oncologist, Southeast Regional Health Authority, as well as he's the acting head of department at Kingston Public Hospital. He's a radiation oncologist trained in Cape Town, South Africa. His interests include breast stereotactic radiotherapy in metastatic prostate cancer and head and neck cancers. His extracurricular activities are equestrianism and tennis. Welcome Dr. Pemberton, whose presentation is radiotherapy in prostate cancer. Please go ahead. Good day, everyone. My name is Dr. Kuhn Pemberton. I am a radiation oncologist. And today I'll be speaking to you about radiotherapy in prostate cancer in Jamaica. So I've amended the title a little bit. I'd like to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to present. I have nothing to declare. So when it comes to radiotherapy and prostate cancer, the main thing for me and any physician should be the approach. What are we trying to achieve? So in terms of doing that, you can jump to his story or history. So his presenting complaint, or what's distressing him, the history of such, 
and past medical history, and in particular, the comorbidities, because this determines what is the rate limiting step in this person's health. The social history is important because, for example, patients who get external beam radiation have to travel daily to and through the treatment center. And the thing about it is if someone is particularly far, it's very difficult for them to actually get there. So these are things that need to be taken into consideration. Family history for gen genetic syndromes because it determines the trajectory of the person's disease. Now, in terms of comorbidities, um, we have the usual ones. And this in particular is called the Charleston Comorbidity Index, a pretty useful tool in the clinical setting because it can give you the mortality rate to the patients based on their comorbidities, which will help you determine if they really need to go through the rigors of treatment for prostate cancer. Now, on examination, you can do a, re a review of the systems. However, it's important to check for hernias um, from our side because we don't want the bowel fixed in a specific area because the radiotherapy has to pass through that area so many times and it can significantly increase the chances of toxicities in terms of the GI system. Now, I have changed it up for my last presentation. We're going to do a sort of patient um, scenario and make it a bit more interactive. So Mr. A.B. is a 64-year-old male who presents with prostate cancer. He has a clinical T1C lesion, his Gleason score is 6. He has a PSC of 7, an IPSS score of 10. His flow is about 15 mils per second, residual bladder volume of 45 mils. Prostate volume about 45 cc's. Socially, his job entails frequent traveling and he wants treatment. So we decided to treat him with low dose rate seed brachytherapy. So Mr. AB, go ahead. Yes, yes, doc, doc, how are you? How does radiation work in cancer treatment? Can you explain that for me, please? So the basis of it is radiation causes DNA damage. Now, in cancer, you tend to have some sort of DNA alteration, and this DNA alteration causes the cancer cell to grow uncontrollably, to spread, and to disobey the laws of the body. That's what cancer is. What we do with radiation is use mainly x-rays or some form of packets of energy that essentially go to the, um, the DNA that's affected and causes it to break. When it breaks, the cell doesn't die right away, However, like most living things, it tries to make two cells that looks like it, that look like it, and that's still mitosis. And in doing so, you need to have intact, sensible DNA. And when we cause that DNA to break, when it tries to do that, it can't make sense of it, and the cells subsequently die. And therefore, that's how you get rid of the cancer. In terms of how much packets of energy we give, think of it as a solar um, panel absorbing the energy from the sun, it's similar. So therefore the amount of energy we give is termed in the unit gray. And therefore what we do is measure how much gray we give to the area to cause the cancer to die. So Mr. AB is getting low dose rate seed brachytherapy and brachytherapy essentially means close to. In this case, the seeds are implanted into the prostate. So, Doug, maybe you can explain why I'm a candidate for brachytherapy, for this specific type of, of, of therapy. So, for brachytherapy, both low dose rate and high dose rate, we choose patients who have low risk disease. Now, there are different criteria. This actually came from the European Association of Urologists, and they looked at low clinical T disease, low Gleason scores, low PSA values, and they looked at the IPSS scores. For us as physicians, what we can look at is the model of conceptualize that we're looking at the patients, what are the patient's wishes. We're looking at the urine and the bladder, um, his flow, his ability to empty his bladder, the prostate, how large the prostate is, and the pathology of disease, the creator of the disease, how aggressive it is. Mr. AB, fortunately, your disease is low risk, and this is something that we can very well do in you, especially if you travel a lot and you want to get treatment. You do the procedure, and then you're out. All right, so tell me about this procedure. What exactly do I have to do? As you say, it's very quick. 
So in seed bracket therapy, we use isotopes or radioactive uh, material and we implant it in the prostate. There are different isotopes you can use. However, the actual procedure, we're going to place you laying down on your back and we can use general anesthesia. And we put a probe inside the rectum and it's called an ultrasound probe. And we actually implant the seeds based on what the prostate looks like on that ultrasound. And we try to avoid your urethra, which is the tube that takes the urine out of the bladder. We take you to the recovery room after that procedure, you're admitted overnight and we check the urine for seeds intermittently. The discharge is done the following day and then at the discharge, we actually ensure that there's no measurable radiation using the counter. And then we actually advise you that you are allowed to have sexual activity one week after the procedure, but we do ask that you use a condom or ejaculate outside of your partner. After the treatment is done, you can do a CT scan in about four weeks post the procedure. That gives time for the edema to subside. And then we do a dose calculation based on where the seeds are. And of course, the amount of radiation or the dose that we'd like to give is about 145 grade. Fortunately, this procedure is available in the private sector in Jamaica. This is what it looks like on the CT scan. So these cellic appearances in the prostate there are the seeds implanted. And these, this can be seen on the, this is post up in terms of the CT image. So can you explain to me what is the benefit of this seed LDR brachiotherapy? Specifically, what's, you know, what's so good about it? So it actually has been shown to reduce the biochemical or increase the bi decrease the biochemical disease free rate. So, um, sorry, increase the biochemical disease free rate. So therefore, what we know is that your rate of biochemical disease free or the prostate specific antigen from going up is at 93% at five years and 85% at 10 years for patients who decide to choose this modality. Okay, fair enough. But the treatment cycle that you had described seems, you know, uh, a little long for my schedule. Is there any faster way that it can be done? So the other way is something called high dose speed bracket therapy. Now, this essentially entails that the radiation goes in and comes out. It doesn't stay inside of you. It's still an operative procedure. It can be given with outside radiation or what we term external beam radiation, or it can be given on its own. Now, this study is one where they compared giving it on its own and giving it with outside radiation, or given outside radiation alone, sorry. And what they have seen is that if you give it with the outside radiation, your biochemical disease free rate is at 75% at five years rather than 61% when you get the outside radiation alone. However, in that study, the dose for the outside radiation or the external beam radiation alone was lower than the dose that we use in our daily practice. Um, in addition to that, a lot of the international recommendations state that you should use it um, to assist when patients can't you know, endure the long duration of the outside radiation, um, so social factors. And it can also be used as salvage therapy, meaning it can be used when the outside radiation has failed in the past. Um, unfortunately, this is not available in Jamaica. Okay. So Mr. BC is a 70-year-old male who presents with prostate cancer. He has clinical T3B disease, meaning his seminal vesicles are involved. His Gleason score is three plus four, and he has a PSE of 25. His life expectancy is more than 10 years. So we have chosen to treat him with external beam radiotherapy and androgen deprivation therapy for three years. So this is what it looks like. He's laying comfortably on this machine. It's called the LINAC. Um, and basically he lays on his back and the machine goes around him to give the treatment. So how do we know that this, this machine works as opposed to the brachiotherapy? So this patient or you, Mr. BC, you actually have high risk disease. So therefore we want to give you the external beam radiotherapy because brachytherapy is actually sort of reserved for patients with low risk disease. However, in the Scandinavian countries, they did trials um, where they compared given the hormones indefinitely meaning for the rest of the person's life and compared it to given the external beam radiation or the outside radiation with three years of the injection or the androgen deprivation therapy. 
And what they found is that there's an improvement in the 10 year prostate cancer specific mortality. And what it essentially means is that you're more likely to be alive at 10 years if you're chosen the treatment of get, getting the outside radiation with the injection. All right, so the radiation is coming from the outside, but how do you know that you're actually treating my prostate? So we use CT scan images. So this right here is what we call an axial slice. So you know like when you cut slices of a loaf of bread, and this actually shows just one slice of the body that CT scan has obtained. That area in green there is the prostate that we have identified. And the area in red actually is just an area in case the prostate moves. So that in case you want to treat the area um, or when you're treating the area, you accommodate for any slight movement and you make sure that you hit your target. The area in blue is the rectum, which takes two lots out of the body. This here is a pet image. And this pet image is showing this bright red area there. That area actually identifies active cancer. All right, it's a special test that's done to do that. What we have done in this slide is actually superimpose the PET scan on the CT scan. And the area in brown identifies the area that I would like to treat. So the benefit of the PET scan is that I'm able to actually see where the cancer is and target it. Now, the aim of radiation is to give as much of radiation as possible to the tumor and spare the organs at risk. There are different techniques in radiation, and now I'm going to turn into a car salesman. There's 3D conformal radiotherapy and intensity modulated radiotherapy, and they're both available in Jamaica. Now, the image on the left is 3D conformal radiotherapy. So that hue of purple and green that you see there is nicely covering the red line of the prostate. However, the hue is sort of transecting the rectum and going halfway through it. All right, and that represents or simulates what the radiation would be like when it's entering the patient's body and going to the prostate. The area on the right has a hue, but it's sort of confined to the area on the red and it's skimming the rectum at the top. So the area on the right is what we call IMRT and the area on the left is what we call 3D conformal radiotherapy. In 3D conformal radiotherapy, what happens is the dosimetry, so the person planning the radiation, tells the machine what to do. Whereas in IMRT, just like how you have these fancy cars that can park themselves, IMRT, you actually do a hands-off approach and the machine figures out the best apertures or algorithms to get the radiation to where it needs to go. And therefore it's better at critical organ sparing and can reduce side effects, including rectal toxicity. Both treatments like any vehicle gets you from point A to point B, but the ride and the side effects or the side effect profile is different. In terms of what are the pros and cons, if you decide to use the one where you're driving the machine, it's more cost effective, it's faster in planning. However, the side effect profile can be a little bit worse. In the IMRT, it is very time consuming and expensive in terms of the process. However, um, it is better at organ sparing. In addition to that, one peculiar thing about it is that the IMRT, the low dose region, or the low doses that go to the other areas of the body is a bit higher because the machine is doing its own thing. Whereas the 3D conformal radiotherapy on, on the left, you have actually shown the machine where it needs to go on the low dose or what you call the low, the integral dose is a lot lower, sorry, I should say. Okay, so in my case, how long is my treatment going to be? No, um, so when we break up the radiation to small days, what we're doing is trying to give a little bit to try to cause the cancer to be damaged or the DNA of the cancer to be damaged, as we said, but it also allows time for repair of the normal organs and the normal tissues. And if we give like two gray per day, 1.8 to two, I should say, to conventional fractionation, but you can actually start to give more. Now, prostate cancer, is termed a slow growing cancer, even though it can be aggressive, all right? And the thing about slow growing cancers is, if you're treating it, or if you're treating the actual tumor, what can happen is, if you extend the time for very long, you actually can lose the benefit and give time for the cancer to start to re repair itself because of the, the slow process through the cell cycle. 
it's one of those cancers where they realize that if you shorten the overall treatment time and you give bigger doses per day, you can actually get a beneficial therapeutic index. So therefore, we term something called hypofractionation in prostate cancers. However, when are you allowed to use it? The thing about it is um, there are studies that support giving a bigger doses per day and shortening the overall treatment time. So this study here in red in the top box, 70 gray in 28 working days, that actually will sort itself to be five and a half weeks roughly. Um, that actually is used in the private sector in Jamaica and I'll tell you why. In the UK, for example, they have started shortening it to as little as 20 working days or four weeks. Um, however, it can extend to as much as seven and a half weeks when you have 78 gray in 39 fractions. In North America, they do something called, well, in very specialized centers and in clinical trials, they use something called ultra or extreme hypofractionation, where you're given as much as five to 10 gray per day. Um, hypofractionation should be associated with image guidance if you're asking yourself when you use it. And what is image guidance? It's the ability to see what you're doing. Now, in this slide here, when we actually do radiation daily, what we do is we line up some lasers to some marks on the skin, but we also do image verification, meaning we do x-rays. So we take the x-ray from the first day of treatment or the first day that we will plan for treatment, and we do an x-ray on the day of treatment before you're treated and we put them on top of each other and we check to see that it matches and then we say okay you can go ahead and treat however as you can see in this x-ray here you're only seeing bones you're not really seeing the prostate the bladder the rectum things that can be full empty or move all right so in that case what you do is you use bigger margins around the area that you want to treat because you can't quite exactly see what you want to However, we have gotten fancy and we're now able to do a CT scan slice that sort of emulates what, it was done, what was done on the first day of planning and put it on top of each other and make sure that the blood is as full as it needs to be, the rectum is as empty as it needs to be, and that you're treating the area in red adequately. There are other ways of doing it. You could actually implant these stellate sorts of materials inside the prostate, as you can see on the CT scan there and they can be made of gold and you can match it up to each other every day by doing that CT scan daily. Or you can actually inject a gel that pushes the rectum away, turn hydrogel away from the prostate so that you know that when you're giving those high doses, you're avoiding the rectum. So what are my side effects? Should I just do surgery instead? Okay, so um, most studies show that there isn't much of a difference in terms of the outcome when it comes to um, surgery versus radiation. However, it's sort of what side effect profile are you willing to, to accept? Now, radiation has been shown to have higher incidences of bowel toxicities. So that includes things like diarrhea, bloody stool, or uh, umbrella term is something called proctitis. Whereas the operation, you're looking at things like urinary leakage and sexual dysfunction. Um, this is, if you choose to do the radiation, this has um, now developed where it shows that men who actually exercise during treatment have lower rates of urinary toxicity. So things like pelvic floor exercises have been shown to be beneficial. In terms of the other side effects, they're all related to things like skin changes, so sunburns around the area where the radiation goes in the pelvis. And you can also get long-term side effects, which we can talk about further. Doc, so is it just my prostate you're going to treat or will it be anywhere else? So that question lets me know that you're reading. So the thing about cancer is it spreads. And one of the ways that it spreads is it uses the lymph for vascular system or lymph nodes. So what you can do is also treat at-risk areas. So the prostate sits in the bottom of the belly in the pelvis, and then you have lymph nodes that actually drain upwards into the belly. So we drain those lymph nodes, or we treat, sorry, those drainage lymph nodes in the belly for high-risk patients. So for you, I would recommend it. In intermediate-risk patients, we can actually do a calculation 
or we can actually use a nomogram and you can use something called the Roach formula that tells you the probability of lymph node involvement in these patients. Where do we treat? So in terms of the lymph nodes, they start in the pelvis and then go up into the belly. And why I'm telling you about this is because a number of studies uh, or this study in particular, they are now starting to show that um, you need to go higher up into, into the belly to get those lymph nodes in certain subsets of patients. And why is that is because in this study in particular, this image in the bottom right hand corner actually shows this red um, sort of uptake and that is positive disease or active disease on a PET CT. Now, when we actually treat the lymph nodes, we just go around the blood vessels with a little bit of a margin. And this study is showing that even if you go high up as well, so they do recommend that you go high up. And they say, even when you go high up, you should be going very wide because this actually evidently shows that when we do the traditional um, sort of margin around the blood vessels, we can still miss disease that's close here in the pink. And the red dotted line sort of indicates that we should be going wider. So Mr. CD is a 68 year old male who presents with prostate cancer, but he has metastatic disease. He has disease that has spread to his lower spine and his sacrum. His Gleason score is four plus four, his PSA is 40, and he has a very, very good performance status. We have chosen to treat his prostate and give him injections to block the hormones. So doc, my question is, why are you treating my prostate if it has spread? It's, it's in other areas of my body. So why my prostate? Evidence-based medicine. So in the United Kingdom, they have this trial called the Stampy trial where they actually look at a subset of patients deemed low volume, cash straight naive metastatic prostate patients, all right? And in those patients, what they saw is that if your metastases or the areas of spread were few in number and limited to the area low down in the pelvis or the virtual bodies, that you can still achieve some bit of a benefit by giving radiation to the prostate only and their injections. So what it has actually shown is that there's an overall survival benefit, benefit at three years if you actually give this treatment regimen. So the treatment is quite short sometimes. It can be about four weeks. Um, you can actually give it over six weeks, but once a week for those who can't make it daily. Mr. DC is a 68-year-old male who presents with a pathological T3A prostate cancer after the prostate has been removed. His post-operative sample showed positive margins, unfortunately. His post-op PSA at six weeks was 0.3. We decided to treat him with adjuvant radiotherapy. So, but doc, the prostate is already out, it's been removed. So what exactly are you treating? So the thing about it is evidence-based. So even though the prostate is out, the fossil, the area where the prostate once was, can be an area that is high risk that needs to be treated to prevent the PSA from rising. This study shows that there's a metastasis free and a survival benefit by giving radiation shortly after the operation has been given. But I would say that I chose this particularly in you because the PSA is a bit high even though the prostate has been taken out. So I was reading that this may not be absolutely necessary, however, Doc. Yes, you've been reading. So you probably would have come across something called early salvage radiotherapy. But I always tell everyone, context, context, context. There are trials to show that you can actually wait to see what the PSA does before you rush to get radiation. Now, this real trial used a PSA of more than or equal to 0 0.2. And these patients have positive margins, all right? But they were saying that you can actually wait to see that the PSA rises or if the PSA rises before you treat and you can have the same outcome. In the UK, they have the radicals trial and they actually showed or use a value of 0 0.1. Now, um, the thing about it is the ESMO 
um, sort of presentation showed that um, most people are in favor, most studies are in favor of early cell with radiotherapy. This meta-analysis actually showed that adjuvant radiotherapy or radiotherapy shortly after the operation with high-risk features can be given to reduce the PSA from rising, but there's no difference in the survival of these patients, meaning those were more likely to be alive at the same time, but they were equally so more likely to be alive at the same time. So I always tell patients, you know, or physicians, you know, you can jump back to the history. You can look at things like the age of the patient, how old is the patient, how long is the patient expected to live, the pathology of the disease before the operation, the PSC, how fast the PSC is dub doubling, and then the NCCN guidelines now recommend a molecular assay or, gen assay, sorry, or genetic sort of assessment to see the chances of how high risk the disease are, and the patient's wishes as well can be also taken into consideration. Mr. E.D. is a 68-year-old male who presents with seminal vesicle involvement post his operation, and he has a Gleason score of 4 plus 3. His margins are clear, however, so we decided to watch him. His PSA at six weeks was undetectable, was undetectable at that time, but his PSA at two years started to rise, 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. We made the decision to investigate him. Now, you can investigate with many modalities, but you have certain sensitivities and specificities. A bone scan and CT scan have been shown to be so, more so sort of specific or sensitive with a PSA of more than 10. You can do a PET scan where you can see where the cancer is active, but it's according to what type of conjugate or radio tracer you'd like to use. If you use choline, it has been shown to be better for bone imaging and not so much good to identify soft tissue disease, nodes, and um, things like the soft tissues like lungs and, and, and liver lesions. However, um, if you add the gadolinium 68 PSMA PET CT to your mix, you're looking at sensitivity rates as high as 86% and specificity rates as high as 100% as compared to other traces. And this is now emerging as a test that you can use to identify any areas of active disease. And this is one particular case that we had where we found an inguinal node in a patient, an active inguinal node on that PET CT. Now, in case you don't have any active disease when you do your PET CT for that patient, for example, there is an option to treat the fossil, just like how we talked about earlier. But this study in particular talks about treating the lymph nodes as well, or the lymph node drainage areas, and giving injections to block the hormones or androgen deposition therapy for six months. And this is where things are heading in terms of treatment for these patients. But Doc, what if the cancer has spread somewhere else? What happens then? So we can do the PET scan, and let's say if the volume of disease is very low, it's just one isolated area, like in the spine or in a specific node, there's something called stereotactic body radiotherapy. And what this essentially does is it's able to target that area, all right, from any angle and give high doses and precise doses of radiation to that one area to eradicate the disease. Now, what is required is that you'll be able to get in from any angle. So that machine that we see here, the linear accelerator, what is able to happen is that you have image guidance, meaning that you're able to see on the inside and line up the areas properly, and the couch can move in any direction to allow the rays of radiation to get in and get to that area specifically. So in summary, radiotherapy works by causing DNA damage. Low dose rate brachytherapy should be reserved for low risk prostate cancer patients, even though it can be used at other risks um, and it is available in the private sector in Jamaica. High dose rate brachytherapy is not available in Jamaica, but for um, theoretical purposes, it can be used with or without external beam or outside radiation and it can also help in shortening the overall treatment time. In addition to that, external beam radiotherapy can be dose escalated and you can give bigger doses per day and shorten your overall treatment time with image guidance. Low volume metastatic castrate naive patients can actually receive radiation to the prostate and androgen deprivation therapy, and it can derive an overall survival benefit. 
adjuvant radiation therapy can actually be considered in patients with high-risk features, positive margins, and T-free disease, but you need to consider other patient-specific factors because there is a rule for early salvage radiotherapy on awaiting the PSA to progress. And therefore, you should actually be looking to see that it doesn't pass 0.2 and no other high-risk features. And of course, that fancy stereotactic body radiotherapy is an option for patients who have isolated disease that you can target and help eradicate the disease. Um, I would like to thank everyone, including the Radiation Oncology Center of Jamaica, the St. Joseph's Hospital National Cancer Treatment Center, and last but not least, the Kingston Public Hospital, and all my supportive staff. These are my resources, and this is my final slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pemberton, for that very excellent, non-traditional presentation. <laughs> very informative. I'm filling in for Ms. Brown at the moment. I'm Dion Thomas. Thank you. Um, our next presenter will be Dr. Gareth Reed. He's a consultant urologist from the University Hospital. He specializes in, he specializes in urology and he has a postgraduate in um, urology, special interests um, outside of medicine, tennis, swimming, volunteering, and outreach activities, as well as family time. Let us welcome um, Dr. Gary Three as our next presenter, and he will be presenting on castrate resistance for prostate cancer. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank the Jamaica Cancer Society uh, once again for our annual press and, and the Jamaica Urological Society for asking me to speak um, on castrate resistant prostate cancer. And, and this is towards the end of the, the symposium and, and somewhat fitting um, as it relates to where prostate cancer um, comes to its terminal conclusion. So uh, essentially, the presentation today is going to be looking at things like some of the importance, epidemiology, um, some of the causes as it relates to castrate resistant prostate cancer, and what ultimately leads to thinking of things in terms of the prognosis. Um, we look as well as the treatment options available, and then finally come with a conclusion. The treatment options is where part of this presentation will become a little bit um, you know, academic and I'll try to keep it um, as, as, as general as potentially possible. So while most men present with localized prostate cancer worldwide, here in Jamaica, um, and as well as the Caribbean, vast majority of our patients present with advanced disease. So advanced disease essentially means, um, and it's, it has been previously discussed, but where the cancer has now left the prostate, either in the localized area or it has metastasized outside of the prostate. And unfortunately, that's where we pick up a vast majority of our patients. And this is just a look at a study done um, a few years back. Um, it's by uh, Dr. Cord, uh, looked at six year analysis of the patients at, uh, uh, with prostate cancer at University Hospital of the West Indies. And unfortunately, as you can see on the graph, most of those patients presented um, with a PSA over 100, which is almost virtually unheard of um, in, in this day and age um, in, in, first world, in the first world setting. Um, this is a graph, and these are figures that have been thrown out through an entire conference, but as you can see there, prostate cancer remains our leading um, mortality. And, and as that relates to cancer resistant prostate cancer, because most patients who die from prostate cancer die at this stage of the disease. So advanced prostate cancer can be really seen in two sets of men. So you have those men who present with metastatic disease, which tend to be most of our Jamaican population. And you have those who had localized prostate cancer, underwent some form of curative treatment but for whatever reason, the cancer did return. Um, and over time, essentially, it progressed on to advanced disease following maximal localized therapy. Now, there are two categories as it relates to um, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And we'll, we'll go into those as the presentation goes on. Um, so I won't go into it that much. 
but essentially this tends to be the kind of direction we go um, from the diagnosis of prostate cancer leading to the ultimate endpoint. Right? So the prostate cancer that is localized or locally advanced, these patients undergo definitive therapy. Um, after definitive therapy, what should happen is the PSA should be undetectable, but for whatever reason, you start getting a rise in PSA. And this is where we call it biochemical recurrence. Um, at that point, we attempt other treatment options, which have been discussed before. We start androgen deprivation therapy. Some of these men um, will respond and some will not. Some will not have any evidence of metastasis. Some will have metastasis. Um, but ultimately, most of these men will go on to cancer-resistant prostate cancer. And we'll, we'll, as I said, I will discuss it a little as we go along further. So most men, almost you know, 100% of men who get androgen deprivation therapy will stop responding to this androgen deprivation therapy and will start to see an increase in the PSA level. Um, these are the men that are referred to as castrate-resistant prostate cancer, especially in a setting where they have low testosterone levels. The median survival of men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer from the time of diagnosis of castrate-resistant prostate cancer is about 15 to 36 months. And this, this is based a lot on the extent of the presenting disease burden. Other studies um, in centers where they have all options available, um, they have seen that median survival go up to even as high as 60 months. But here, and I think we would apply to somewhere in this region, our median survival is closer to 15 to 36 months. So castrate-resistant prostate cancer represents the lethal form of this disease. Um, most prostate cancer deaths will occur in men at this stage where they are metastatic castrate-resistant, um, who have metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. It is defined by the American Neurological Association as disease progression despite the use of androgen deprivation therapy and a castrate level of testosterone, along with one of the following. They have biochemical progression. So you have three consecutive rises in the PSA at least one week apart, resulting in 25 increase over the lowest number called the nadir, with that PSA being greater than two nanograms per ml. Or they have radiographic progression, which is where they have the appearance of new lesions, either two or more new bone lesions on a bone scan and confirmed by another imaging modality, such as a CT or MRI. Um, the, the European Association of Urology, essentially, is, I mean, it's a similar kind of discussion. Um, they have the same castrate serum testosterone will be less than 50 nanograms per deciliter. But you buy for biochemical progression, it's the same three consecutive rises, but they want to see at least two of them being 50% over that nadir, meaning the lowest PSA level that the patient had. Um, and similar for the radiological progression. So how does castrate resistant prostate cancer occur? And remember I said this happens to almost every man who has some form of advanced disease. So during androgen deprivation therapy, there are no circulating androgens to bind to the androgen receptor to aid with tumor growth. And as such, we see the PSA levels fall, the patients improve from a, both from a symptomatic perspective and from a biochemical perspective. But in castrate resistant prostate cancer, and this happens almost all the time, prostate cancer cells find ways around the, the lack of androgens that are circulated. So they begin to utilize androgens by either making it themselves. So what happens in androgen deprivation therapy, as was discussed, your testicles no longer are gonna be producing testosterone. There'll be a few, there's a, be a small amount being produced by the adrenal gland and the prostate cancer cells start to use any um, circulating testosterone. But outside of that, as I said, the cells themselves either begin to make the, the, the androgens themselves um, and that same tumor microenvironment can increase androgen production and as such, the prostate cancer with cells uh, will now begin to thrive once again. Another potential reason that most of these are theories because of the low circulating androgens, there's actually an increased androgen receptor expression so to pick up any tiny amount of circulating androgens and start restart growth. Other things that can occur or do occur, the androgen receptor genes mutate um, and they become what we say is promiscuous. They start being activated, not just by testosterone and, and circulating androgens, but by 
um, other substances such as glucocorticoids. Um, other things, you can have alterations of the angiogenic receptor signaling to promote tumor growth. And you can have synthesis of angiogenic receptor variants, um, a common one being ARB7. So moving on to potential treatment options. So the choice of therapy is really dependent on a few things. So what therapy was used initially when the patient was diagnosed, um, the performance status of the patient, so how well the actual patient is in terms of being able to tolerate any type of treatment, and of course, finding the life expectancy. And all of these, a lot of the discussion or rather treatment choice has to be a shared decision process between the patient um, and their treating physician. Now, for cancer resistant prostate cancer, there are a wide variety of, um, of people who are involved in terms of the treatment. So there's a urologist, there's the oncologist, um, the palliative specialist, a big part of it as well as the, the family support. So I want you to take a look on this um, slide and you know, the one on the left kind of shows what treatment was available in 2000 as opposed to 2020. Um, when the patient was had metastatic, either non-metastatic or metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer, there were very few treatment options. And as such, the, um, the overall survival rates were very low. And then look on, you know, the last 20 years, it's been a, almost a complete explosion of potential treatment options. And we have seen benefit in terms of, um, you know, symptom, symptoms in terms of how the patients feel and in terms of the overall survival, but we still are not able to, you know, the, the prognosis still remains quite poor when you reach this stage of the disease. So there are many treatment options and sequencing of these options um, remain quite difficult. And as such, the American Neurological Association came up with a patient kind of stratification according to um, prior use of chemotherapy in terms of docetaxel, what the performance status is and the presence of symptoms. And there are essentially six index patient categories and treatment options available based on different levels of evidence, clinical principles and expert opinion. So I'm gonna go through these index patients and it kind of helps you to figure out in terms of what direction these patients should be encouraged to go. So I'm gonna start off with these patients who are known as the asymptomatic non-metastatic castor resistant prostate cancer. So these are patients who underwent some form of definite curative intent therapy. So they either had surgical treatment or they had radiation therapy. And after, you know, they, what they noticed is the PSAs were not undetectable. They actually had biochemical recurrence. So they had rising PSA, but there was no radiological evidence of metastatic disease. Um, and they were now being treated with, usually with androgen deprivation therapy, and they progressed on to becoming castrate resistant. So despite androgen deprivation therapy, they had a rise in PSA. Now these patients should be monitored with PSAs every three to six months, um, with conventional imaging every six to 12 months. If the PSA doubling time was greater than 10 months, then these patients shouldn't, you know, as a very slow rise, they should just be observed. Um, if the PSA doubling time was short, so less than 10 months, these were the patients based on the evidence level who, who were found to have a high risk of developing metastatic disease and as such should be treated. So it can be treatment options, androgen deprivation therapy, and, and these were the three drugs, or these are the three drugs that are useful in this, this type of patient. So there's enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darlutamide. And I'm not gonna spend too much time looking on the studies, um, which looked on the evidence, but I'll just show you. So this was a PROSPER trial. Um, so the evidence for the use of enzalutamide. And the area we want to look at is the median metastasis-free survival. So this was 36.6 months versus 14.7 months. That's for enzalutamide. For apalutamide, similar positive results of 40.5 months um, versus 16.2 months in the placebo group. And then this is evidence for darolutamide, which so was 40.4 months compared with 18.4 months metastas metastasis-free survival. So all three agents, excellent um, in terms of decreasing that chance of you becoming metastatic cancer resistant and as such decreasing the risk of death or um, essentially increase that overall survival. Um, 
So this, I just put in a slide, looking at what NCCN um, does for that, that non-metastatic cancer resistance and prostate cancer, which is very similar, almost the exact same thing as it relates to um, the treatment option for that index patient one um, for the American Urological Association. So moving on now to those who progress or either present as metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer. So multiple agents, and I'm gonna try to essentially go through some of the sequencing. Um, so they, these patients really should have an informed discussion about the prognosis and the treatment decisions and treatment options. Um, they should have based on labs done, review and the location of metastatic, metastatic disease because it helps now in terms of monitoring these patients, look on their actual symptoms and look on the performance status to aid you in terms of treatment. So this is your AUA index patient two. So this is the asymptomatic or only minimally symptomatic metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer as well as not had prior dose taxol therapy. And these are the treatment options, abiraterone, um, you know, with a combination of prednisone or switching to dexamethasone. Um, there's an agent called cipolucel T and of course chemotherapy um, from docetaxel. Um, sorry. So this was the evidence looking on abiraterone in the patient who had metastatic prostate cancer without previous chemotherapy. The overall survival was, was much higher in these patients um, as opposed to compared to pregnant, um, to placebo. Um, this, this was the evidence for cipulucel T. Once again, there was a relative reduction, relative re reduction of about 22% in the risk of death. Um, but remember, this is a very either asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic patient. Um, this is your AUA index patient three. So this is now the one who is symptomatic with a good performance status and no prior chemotherapy. The treatment options that are available that, that are suggested based on evidence is things like abiraterone and pred in combination with prednisone, docetaxel, um, as well as radium 223, which essentially can be given to patients with bony metastasis but who have no visceral metastasis. And what radium 223 is, is essentially it's an alpha emitting radio pharmaceutical, which is capable of inducing double stranded DNA breaks um, in the cancer cells minimizing exposure to the surrounding marrow. And it's really useful in patients who have bony metastasis um, as opposed to any visceral metastasis. Um, and it relies on the chemical similarity to calcium and the ability of the alpha radiation and that short-lived decay products to kill the cancer cells. So we do not offer cipulucel T or estromostine to the patients, the AUA index patient three. The, AUA, the index patient four is a symptomatic metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer with a poor performance status with no prior dose attack. So the recommendation, abiraterone in combination with prednisone as well as enzalutamide. You may offer radium-223 if there are no visceral, visceral meds. You may offer things like ketoconazole, though the evidence does not, um, isn't as good um, or in terms of that, that improvement, both in PSA symptoms and overall survival. The, Index patient five is a symptomatic metastatic cash resistant prostate cancer with good performance status with prior dose of taxol therapy. Options here are abiraterone once again. You can use a, a different chemotherapeutic, a different taxin, so cabazitaxel. Enzalutamide is an option, radium-223. Um, and other options, things like ketoconazole, which is gonna be a cheaper direction, but once again, not the best um, all evidence for, for support, or you could consider retreatment with docetaxel. Um, I mentioned cabazitaxel, which is a second generation toxin, broader range of cytotoxicity and high potency, um, and has a better blood brain barrier penetration and can be used in the patients who have had prior docetaxel therapy. Um, this in this patient six is the metastatic um, cancer resistant prostate cancer with poor performance status with prior dose of And really the key element is palliative treatment. As the mainstay of treatment, the emphasis should be on quality of life. 
You may offer agents such as abiraterone, enzalutamide, ketoconazole, but be wary of the potential side effects and always put emphasis on quality of life at the top as your top priority. They should not be offered chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So other considerations with cancer-resistant prostate cancer, bone health, genetic testing, palliative care, um, and some of the other histological subtypes. So for bone health, 90% of patients with metastatic disease will have some form of skeletal involvement. This leads to different skeletal related events such as severe bony pain, pathological fractures, spinal cord compression, um, potential requirement for radiation or, or surgery. Um, and then what happens is that you have excess osteoclastic activity occurring in these patients, inducing bone destruction. And androgen deprivation therapy, also one of the mainstays of treatment of patients with metastatic disease, um, also can worsen your bone health. So there's some non-pharmacological recommendations that you start right at the beginning. So you, you know, encourage weight-bearing exercises and muscle-building exercises, balance exercises, no smoking, no alcohol, increase that calcium and vitamin D intake. Um, you want to bring in a, a, a estimated daily calcium requirement about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams, either from food or supplements, um, and an estimated vi daily vitamin D requirement of about 1,000 international units, um, similarly from, from agents. Other, you know, these are some of the pharmaceutical agents, denosumab, denosumab, and bisphosphonate use. So denosumab is a human monoclonal antibody against rank ligand. Um, Rank ligand is essentially the main driver of osteoclast formation, function, and survival. And the action of it is to inhibit that rank ligand. Um, the evidence for it is pretty good. Once again, this is um, a large phase three study over almost 2,000. Um, and it showed that the median time to first skeletal re related event was 20 months versus 17.1 months in favor in Nusimab over things like the zoledronic acid. Um, so it is superior to other bisphosphonates, not available in, in, you know, locally, but it's a good agent. Um, what we do have bisphosphonates, they work, they block bone destruction, um, and that's zoledronic acid. Um, and then, then the rate, this one of the, from an evidence perspective, did show that it does work. It decreases the, the skeletal related events over a placebo. Um, and it was a statistical significant um, improvement as it relates to bone health. Now, genetic testing, so germline testing, somatic tumor testing. So up to 30% of men um, with metastatic prostate cancer may have abnormalities in the genes involved in repairing that DNA damage. So we do recommend germline and somatic tumor testing, um, looking for things like BRCA1, BRCA2, um, and the other agents, the other uh, genes listed there. There is also the loss of, loss of function um, in terms of alterations in genes with a direct or indirect role in homologous recombination repair. And that has been found to have a higher association with uh, more aggressive prostate cancer. And the most common kind of changes, once again, BRCA1, BRCA2, um, or ATM genes. And there are other genes listed as well. As for the scope of this presentation, I'm not going to go into too much detail there. Um, what is important to know, we can use this germline testing to apply to treatment. So there are things like PARP inhibitors, polyadenosine diphosphate ribose inhibitor therapy. So that drug is called oloparin. Um, and this is indicated for treatment of metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer patients with a pathogenic mutation um, in the homologous recombination repair gene following androgen receptor di directed therapy. Um, and that kind of shows the eligibility criteria and it did improve um, or did show a median overall survival was improved by about 10.1 months. Um, Luca Parib, once again, um, the treatment for those with metastatic disease, cancer resistant disease with a pathogenic BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation as well as homologous recombinant gene um, mutations. And this is once again, same following treatment with both angioreceptor directed therapy and taxane-based therapy, which show that overall response rate about 40% at the time during um, testing, but ongoing studies. Um, so it's still a little unclear. This is the targeted therapy. 
pembrolizumab. I always have difficulty pronouncing that. It's an anti-PD-1 antibody. And this is used for patients with um, MSI high or mismatch repair deficient metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer. Um, and these patients, the concern, of course, is uh, you're looking at other things like Lynch syndrome um, and journal intestinal for Lynch syndrome. Uh, these patients also, no, you know, they're not just prostate cancer, you have to be concerned about um, but the other potential diseases in Lynch syndrome. So coming to the end here, other considerations. So you can have uh, just an adenocarcinoma, which makes up vast majority of prostate cancer. You can have a small cell carcinoma or neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Um, and this is more common in men with metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer. And about 70% you can have small cell carcinoma. And you consider these patients, um, and you consider this in patients who no longer respond to androgen deprivation therapy and have metastatic disease, or if they have a very low PSA with high metastatic burden, um, or they have initial Gleason 5, uh, you always have to have them back in mind, is this potentially like a small cell carcinoma or neuroendocrine tumor. These patients should be managed with cytotoxic chemotherapy agents very early um, in their disease process. So you use cisplatin, etoposide, or carboplatin, etoposide, as opposed to the toxins. So that's a lot. Um, I'm not going to go into much any any you know other significant areas. That's a general summary of castrate resistant prostate cancer. It essentially represents that final lethal stage of prostate cancer. The landscape has been changing over the last 20 years, I should say, with regards to an explosion of treatment options and improvement in morbidity and overall survival. It is still a very um, lethal stage of the disease. And the key, you know, as has been prompted, I think, from the first presentation is we really need to get early diagnosis, early tr treatment to essentially try and limit those patients who will eventually progress to this castor resistant stage. Um, there's a lot of challenges in terms of balancing the sequencing and timing of these, these treatment options. Um, and the role of genetic testing has also opened up new potential treatment options. Um, and the overall survival has improved, but remains much lower than hoped for. And with time, we hope that you know, those who will fall in this area, will, we, we will be able to offer agents that offer excellent um, improvements over our survival, but we are not there yet. An early diagnosis has to be the key. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed, for that excellent presentation. We're now joined by Dr. Stephen Alexander. He's from Hope Institute. He's a medical officer, and his area of specialization is clinical oncology. He's graduated from the University of the West Indies. Fellow of the College of Radiation Oncology, South Africa, and his special interests and activities are resting. Please go ahead, Dr. Alexander. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Alexander. In the medical atmosphere, I'm known as Dr. Stephen Alexander. I'm a clinical oncologist. I work at the Hope Institute, and my presentation is palliative care in prostate cancer. A clinical oncologist is a doctor who specializes in radiation oncology and has a, has a vast wealth of knowledge in chemotherapy as well. So without further delay, I shall progress to my presentation. Um, so my presentation is going to be quite simple, palatable, and perhaps things may have been mentioned earlier, but repetition is good. So here are my objectives. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a recap on palliative care. And then we're going to talk about problems prostate cancer patients may face and some of the solutions that we may be able to offer. Okay, so what is palliative care? Um, palliative care focuses on preventing and relieving suffering and on supporting the best quality of life for patients who are facing a serious or life-threatening illness. And it also encompasses the treatment of their families. In other words, someone who is very sick, you focus on the patient, you focus on the family members as well, and you focus also, which is not said here, on the caregivers, all the persons who are involved in the patient's um, well-being. 
It also establishes goals of care that are in keeping with the patient's values and preferences. Um, and I'll give an example. I did a home visit the other day about a, for a patient who was quite ill, pre-terminal, as we would say. And, you know, she was vomiting, she had bowel obstruction, and I opted to admit this patient. And I was making my plans, and I'm like, yes, let's go and admit this patient. And the patient says, yes, doc, I agree with your plans, but I don't want to be admitted to the hospital. So I was putting my plans in place, but she had a total different preference based on her cultural belief, based on her background. She was more comfortable at home. So you have to bear that in mind as well. All right, so who is involved in, in the palliative care um, setup? So of course, the head of the team is a doctor, but we are really just a, a figurehead um, for argument's sake. Palliative care involves the nurses. The nurses are with the patient 24 seven, and they may pick up on certain things that the doctor won't pick up on. We are busy, we have other patients to see. The nurses are there to give the motherly affection um, simple things like saying, you know, nurse, I want to sit outside. I want to get some sunshine. I want to be by the window. The doctor may not be able to pick up on that type of stuff. And the, pa the patients may be a bit nervous to tell the doctor that as well. So the nurse is always good. Of course, there, there's a social aspect of it. Um, social worker input is quite important. A lot of these patients, they have the, they have the family members who are very much involved. They have the caregivers who are very much involved, and many of them want their social issues addressed before some of them move on to the next stage of their life, which may be, in this case, sometimes death. Um, the psychologist as well. Last week, we had a patient who wanted to commit suicide, so we needed psychological um, evaluation and involvement to calm us down as well as calm down the patient. And all the stakeholders involved, the caregivers, the nursing staff, simple things like not ostracizing the patient, not talking to the patient in a particular manner, just calming the situation down. Those are things that the doctor may overlook, the nurse may overlook, and the social worker may overlook as well. Physiotherapy involvement as well. So patients from time to time, they're not, they're still quite well, and they need little exercises to carry out their daily living and a physiotherapist can inv be involved and show them small exercises that once again, the doctor may not be privy to or know about. And certainly, last but not least, the occupational therapist. At Hope Institute, what we aim to do is um, treat, symptom treat symptomatically, so treat the symptoms, the pain, et cetera. But a lot of these patients end up at home again, and you have to, modify the home situation. So occupational therapist is, for want of a better word, um, per se, a nice interior decorator. The bathroom may be too far from that particular bedroom that the patient is sleeping in. So you have to move the patient to a different room. You may need to make the, the home wheelchair friendly. You may need to put a commode. You may need to move the dresser, the, the, the cabinet where clothes, that clothes is kept, that type of stuff. And it doesn't stop there. They need to incorporate the, the setup of the family or the caregivers as well who are involved actively in the, patient, the patient's care. All right, so simply put, um, what is a palliative approach to a prostate cancer patient? And generally speaking, it is quite simple. You want to assess the patient. And assessing the patient, you're going to think about the comor comorbidities. Many of these patients are elderly gentlemen. Um, and as they get older, the hypertension starts to play a role in life, the diabetes, you're generally getting weaker. And that brings us to performance status of the patient. Um, more recently, you have the Karnoskoffi score. I perhaps didn't pronounce that correctly. And you have the ECOG score. Um, those are actual academic tools to assess how well a patient is. Also, you have life expectancy formulas. So what you want to do is, if a prostate cancer patient, you want to see how long they live. It sounds a bit raw, but the reason why you're doing this, you want to actually ascertain how aggressive you are going to be with your treatment. And last but not least, 
age. We're not ageist, but I mean, he can have an eight year old patient who looks quite well and you want to give him the full onslaught of the treatment versus a 70 year old patient who's quite ill, has many comorbidities, looks weak. So all these things should be taken into consideration in your assessment before you implement any cancer treatment. All right, so this is one of the tools used internationally, and this depends on how academic you want to be. Um, as you grow in the profession of oncology, you get a muchness of what you, or how you like to approach a patient. So eventually, you know, you look at this table, um, when you start and you assess the patient based on what this table says, you give them a particular score, and based on that particular score, you can now go on to say how aggressive you will treat this patient. But generally speaking, this is more of for the academic side of stuff. And um, as I say, the more you, the more experience you get, you get a muchness of, of how aggressive you're going to be. So let us go through this table. It talks about food intake in the last three months. It talks about weight loss in the last three months, mobility, neuropsychological problems, body mass index, um, how many, how many times per day the patient takes their medication, um, how the, patient, the patient's age, and self-related health status compared to other people in the same age group. And they give them a score. But this is one of many tools that they can find. But as I said, this is for the academics. And if you want to have good documentation of why such and such treatment plan was, was used. Also, we have this thing called e-prognosis. And what this does is, kind of gives an estimate of the time, the life expectancy of the patient. And they give you these formulas. Um, they use this formula behind the scenes and I give you a number, I should say. So what this entails is how ambulatory the patient is, what is the patient's daily activity, um, how much self-care assistance does the patient require, how much oral intake does this patient have, and what is the patient's level of consciousness. The thing with um, e-prognosis, it doesn't give you an exact date, nobody can, right? Um, it doesn't say, okay, next week at 9 a.m., um, Mr. Brown is going to die, nothing like that. It, does give, it gives you a range, and based on that range, you have more information um, on how, to, how active or how aggressive you're going to be in the patient's management. But like I said, you get a muchness of this. Um, before I go into some other details about um, palliative care in prostate cancer patients. I just would like to point this out that patients who are metastatic, prostate cancers who are metastatic and who have low burden disease, you can still give them prostate directed therapy. And let me expound on, on that. So low burden metastases is defined as patients with prostate cancer uh, with four or fewer metastases and none should be outside of the vertebral body or pelvis and they shouldn't have any visceral metastases. Um, in, in other words, as we said, they, they mustn't have a lot of cancer elsewhere and none of the prostate cancer should sp spread to the, to the lung, to the brain and to the abdominal organs. Um, so it must be low and they must look very well. What has studies have found, the HORAD trial and the Stampede trial, <clears throat> it's a bit academic here. If you give these patients radiotherapy or even systemic therapy, Sorry, we have to give them radiotherapy rather than systemic therapy. So radiotherapy plus systemic therapy, which is the ADT and the chemotherapy, et cetera. These patients do better than if, than if you don't. So in other words, if you have a low burden of, of prostate cancer, yes it's, it's, yes, it's still stage four disease. And you treat these patients like you're going to treat them to cure them. These patients do better. Just bear that in mind. So let us not just put on our palliative blindfolds and just say, oh, you have stage four disease. You're going there, you're not going to do much for you, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to dis dispel that as well. We still can do a lot for you if you have a low burden of metastasis. All right. <clears throat> so watchful waiting. Watchful waiting has been around from time memorial. The other name for watchful waiting is observation. And this concept is quite interesting. Basically, what it is is offering um, palliative treatment to patients with localized prostate cancer who are quite frail. In other words, for these patients, if you give them aggressive prostate cancer management, it is likely that they'll pass or succumb to the management instead of 
of actively of actively um treating them. So right, so watch for waiting. So palliative, so this is palliative care made on the basis that definitive treatment for localized prostate cancer will not benefit the patient. So what happens in this type in this concept? A patient who has localized prostate cancer, i.e., the prostate cancer hasn't spread outside of the pelvis, but they are quite frail. You still want to treat them, or you, you don't want to give them too much radical treatment because they they may succumb to the radical treatment rather than succumbing to the prostate cancer, and you manage these patients symptomatically. So, for example, a patient who is let's say 90 years old has a lot of comorbidities. Um, and only has disease confined, confined to the pelvis. Um, these patients, the life expectancy is, is likely to be very short. And if you treat them aggressively, if you give them a, this, a higher dose of radiation, it may make them quite ill. Rather than doing that, you tailor your treatment, you give them under the deprivation therapy. If they're having um, localized symptoms to shrink the prostate, if the androgen deprivation and therapy is not working well and it's not working fast enough, you can do a transurethral resection of the prostate gland just to kind of ease um, the passage of urine. So that's a good concept. Um, and it is palliative care. It was in, implemented by the urologist and the oncologist coming together to form a treatment um, plan. Um, so some symptoms are some conditions rather that uh, prostate cancer patient may experience. So one of the symptoms, unfortunately, is spinal cord compression. And what happens is that you get, a, you get a metastasis to one of the vertebral bodies, the vertebral body collapse, collapses, and it presses on the spinal cord. Um, if you look at the, the brain as a computer and a spinal and a spinal cord as a cord, electric cord carrying information from the brain to the rest of the body and from the rest of the body to the brain. If there is a kink in that um, connectivity, anything below that kink, um, the brain cannot actually have knowledge of what is taking place. So it cannot receive information from what is taking place below that kink and it cannot give information to areas of the body below that kink. It is an emergency. These patients need to be dealt with. Full treatment should occur within 72 hours. Unfortunately, our medical landscape um, doesn't allow for that. What you should do is have an emergency MRI. Patients need to be counselor on the, on, the, on the outcomes of this because the treatment sometimes is unfortunate in terms of they don't get full restoration of, of function. Um, so MRI, you want want to give these patients androgen deprivation therapy and you want to place them on steroids. Just, just for note, um, we have Lectrum and Gosarelin, and those are GNRH um, agonists. So those give a flare of testosterone. And just some physiology here, prostate cancer, how it grows is by feeding on testosterone. And if you get an initial flare, of testosterone, the prostate cancer might actually grow for a day or two and worsen the spinal cord compression. So if, if what you have available is um, gosarelin or luprolide, you perhaps want to give um, bicalutamide to block the, block the excessive testosterone from reaching the tumor and prevent that prostate flare. You need to get a neurosurgical team involved because they may be able to actually remove that, that um, that tumor that is causing the compression. And these people need to be involved early. Um, if newer says they're not going to um, partake and you don't have any ADT present, you can do a bilateral orchidectomy, which is, as we say in Jamaica, you cut off the patient's balls and you watch for neurological improvement for two days, and then you can consider, consider radiotherapy. On the market now, we have Degarelix, which is a GR, GNRH antagonist, which is quite good. Um, and it prevents the testosterone flare. So we have made a slight improvement in that. Um, so I got this from the Game of Thrones, the Unsolid. And this, these young boys, unfortunately, in the series had had a bilateral orchidectomy. Um, this is an MRI showing, I just get to move my cursor right here. This is a T2 weighted MRI showing 
um, a prostate cancer metastasis somewhere in the thoracic region impinging on the spinal cord. The highlighted or the white areas are the spinal cord fluid and the dark area is actually the spinal cord. And this is a tumor, as you can see, squeezing the spinal cord. So anything below this, the, the brain can't perceive and the brain can't send any information below this. Um, so moving right along, we have metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer. And uh, for these patients, what you want to start them on is ADT. And we have three trials where this is concerned, the charter, the stampede, and the, and the latitude. And what, the, what these trials showed is that patients had better progression-free survival with the use of docetaxel and abiraterone. Um, fortunately for us in, in Jamaica, we have docetaxel relatively available. The cost may be a bit challenging. The last time I checked, it was about thirty dollars to $60,000 per month. But most patients are able to afford it through, through, through their own finances or, or, or having friends, help them, friends and family. And also we have abiraterone. Um, abiraterone just works on the um, adrenal glands and it prevents the, the um, further production of, of testosterone. The unfortunate thing about this is that overall survival was not seen in gentlemen over the age of 70. So even though you, you added your docetaxel and your abiraterone, it worked below, it did better for men who were below 70, but gentlemen who were over 70, um, you know, it didn't do so well for those guys. All right, um, and generally speaking, and this is something that we do here in Jamaica, we give ADT, so ADT is, is, is mandatory, and then we can give docetaxel time, six cycles, or abiraterone, and it does work quite well. You want to tailor your patients, because remember, ADT does come with the side effects. It does come with the loss of, of muscle mass. It does come with the worsening of of um, cardiovascular side effects. It does come with decreased bone density. So patients who are on ADT, and I know most doctors forget, should get vitamin D. Luckily in Jamaica, we have a good amount of sunshine and they should be on calcium tablets as well. Um, remember the docetaxel does cause some, cause some myeloid suppression. So it may knock out your white blood cells and may cause you to get a bit anemic as well. And also docetaxel, those cause some neuropathy, so the numbness in the fingers. Um, abiraterone can cause cardiac conditions and it can cause um, generalized swelling based on the physiology of abiraterone. All right, um, so moving along, and this is a bit more academic. So two trials have demonstrated the superiority of adding a second systemic agent, daralutamide or abiraterone to, to docetaxel. Remember ADT is still mandatory. Um, and these are in patients with metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer with a lot of disease. But once again, you have to look at how well these patients are doing based on, you know, your muchness, which have developed over your career, or you can look at, you can be more academic and look at um, online calculators to determine prognosis as well. Um, so metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So this is prostate cancer in, um, in patients who have, who the testosterone levels is quite low, our testosterone level is quite low, and the normal cutoff value is 50 nanograms per millimeter. Once again, you can use docetaxel, abiraterone, you can use your peripheral testosterone blocking agents, um, bicalutamide, daralutamide, enzalutamide. Enzalutamide and daralutamide are, are newer kids on the block. They have been around for quite some time, but bicalutamide is, um, has been for, around for quite some time. Sepalucel T, that's where you train your own lymphocytes to attack the cancer. That's a bit more time consuming, a bit more technical, and the cost benefit analysis may not be so well applied here in Jamaica. You have your radium 223, which is basically injecting um, radioactive elements, in this case, radium, and it circulates in the body and it goes specifically to the areas with the prostate bone metastases. And uh, you know it gives out alpha radiation to kill the metastases. 
Also, you have cabazitoxel. Um, cabazitoxel is a similar class of drug to docetaxel. It causes less, less peripheral neuropathy. The issue with cabazitoxel or the issue with this general algorithm is that you want to use um, um, docetaxel first and save cabazitoxel for later. Um, and these options have been, have been shown to improve survival and they offer other treatment options for males or gentlemen with castrate resistant um, prostate cancer. All right, so this, apologies. So this is um, a patient who actually was treated with um, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer um, with lutetium and word on the street is that the University of the West Indies is looking to advance their nuclear medicine department. So hopefully this will be somewhere on the horizon in the short future. For the academics out there, what, what this does is it has a, you use something called prostate specific membrane antigen. And what you do is target, or you create an antibody that finds prostate specific membrane antigen. And anywhere prostate specific membrane antigen is in the body, that antibody will find it. And to that antibody, you tag along um, a substance. In this case, it's called lutetium, which emits beta radiation. So anywhere you have prostate specific membrane antigen in the body, lutetium will, once lutetium is bound to once lutetium is bound to, the, to that antibody, it will accumulate there and it will kill the cancer that's there. There's a caveat to this in that um, some prostate cancers, the newer endocrine prostate cancers and the poorly differentiated prostate cancers don't have prostate specific mem membrane antigen. And this treatment not, will, may not be so useful in those, in those cases, but it does work. So on the left, on my left, um, you have a patient before the treatment of lutetium and on the right you have the patient um, post lutetium treatment and generally speaking they continue this treatment for six cycles similarly to the, to the radium 223 six cycles about um, every every three weeks every three to six weeks and you can you continue until toxicity is experienced and the toxicities are myelosuppression, nausea, vomiting, mucositis, you know, you, you have diarrhea, um, or until six cycles. You don't want to cause severe bone marrow suppression. All right, so other palliative options, and this is where I come into play. You can give radiotherapy for bone pain. It is quite useful. It's very short and easy to do. You do a simple x-ray, you, you see the bone lesion, and you give a two centimeter margin, a one shot two centimeter um, margin on that, on that bone metastasis. Very easy to do. We can do that here in Jamaica, quite readily available. Also, you have zoledronic acid and other um, bisphosphonates for bone metastases. Um, those help with the bone integrity. The side effect of that is causing hypocalcemia. Um, and it's generally good. You can also use it for osteopenia in elderly patients. So that's something that's useful, which is quite readily really available in, in Jamaica. Um, you have denosumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against the osteoclast breaking down the bones. So osteoclasts are like cells that break down the bones, and these are quite abundant in prostate cancer patients. Zoledronic acid and denosumab help with bone remodeling, help with bone strengthening. And you can also use it in hypercalcemia, which prostate cancer patients may experience from time to time. Um, pain control, very important in prostate cancer patients. For bone pains, for bone pain, we want to use um, NSAIDs. NSAIDs work well with bone pain. Celecoxid, if you don't have celecoxid because of cost reasons, but the price should be coming down, you can use ibuprofen, diclofenac. Um, Oral analgesic. So some of these patients are getting weaker and weaker, and we're using oral analgesics. We're using liquid analgesics that can't that can't swallow their pain medication. We can use we can use sorry morphine for the oral analgesics, liquid version of morphine. And if they can't swallow their pain medication, we can use transdermal uh, medication. So so we have 
um, fentanyl patches, um, and we can give also medication subcutaneously. So no matter what level of ability you have to swallow, we can give you something that relieves your pain. Um, and subcutaneously, we can give you we can give you morphine, we can give you fentanyl as well. Um, so this is a I took this off of the, off the internet. This is a patient with sclerotic pelvic metastasis. Um, that's a typical <laughs> prostate, which is typically seen in prostate cancer patients. You start these patients on um, pain medication, and what we can offer here is some palliative radiotherapy as well. Um, so in summary, palliative care, you want to incorporate early and the outline, the, you need to outline the goals of treatment and many treatment options are available. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. And we are very happy to have had that presentation. It's a lot clearer over the years. You've touched on palliative care in prostate cancer. What in depth that you have gone in terms of showing us how persons can be treated for the disease and still have a little life, um, you know, in them before such time. Thank you so much. Now we are joined by Sharon Jones of the National Health Fund. She's a manager of health promotion and public relations. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, we're going to have a short presentation just to introduce some of the new services that the NHF has offered within the last two years. I am actually showing my slides now. OK, so it's just a brief overview of the National Health Fund program. Some of the new services include merging the NHF card and the JADEP card. We have a new application form and also a brand new online registration system for doctors to help speed up the registration process for our patients. So most persons in the audience would be aware of the National Health Fund, which provides um, um, various services to the health sector. We've worked very closely with Jamaica Cancer Society through outreach screening, and we have in place what is a what is called a contract with Jamaica Cancer Society to provide screening um, for men across the island. And we have a very successful partnership so far. So the National Health Fund covers 17 chronic conditions, and of course, prostate cancer is one of those conditions, as well as benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And for our elderly patients, these conditions are also um, included for JADEP, persons 60 years and older. There are 10 additional conditions that are on the JADEP program. And the JADEP program is very, um, very um, close to us because we are providing the additional services for our senior citizens, helping them to access their medication. So their medication is actually free they only pay a service charge of $40 per item and a maximum, maximum of $240. So our senior citizens, um, once they are diagnosed and on treatment for any of these conditions, they are not supposed to be um, paying too much for their medication. And we are definitely trying to push our JADEP patients to, to get on the, um, the, the JADEP program. So for the total enrollment, National Health Fund card, we have a total of close to 600,000 beneficiaries on a row, enrolled. And for a senior citizens 60 years and over, we have um, 132,000. So we're lagging behind with our senior citizens being um, accessing this very important service to help them with their medication. Also, um, we have five conditions accounted for 74% of the total number of enrollees on our program, um, hypertension being the highest. Then we have um, vascular conditions, diabetes, high cholesterol, and arthritis. So those are the top conditions that are enrolled on the NHF program. Prostate cancer, of course, is one of the conditions, as I mentioned before, we have just about 21,200 
men who are enrolled on NHF card program that accessing the prostate cancer um, benefits. And we have 60,741 enrolled for the benign prosthetic um, hyperplasia. And this month is very special for us because we really want to promote more persons um, if they're on treatment to get the NHF card so they so um, they can get the additional help once the drug is on the, um, the NHF card program. And also at the drugstore pharmacy, once the medication is on the government's VEN list, the medication in the drugstore pharmacy is also free, of course. Additional access to medication, private prescription. Private prescriptions are only accepted for approved drugs used in the treatment of specific illnesses, including so while the National Health Fund makes provision for public patients overall, there is an additional provision for persons with private prescription. And some of the conditions are renal disease, HIV, cancer, of course, mental illnesses, attention deficits, hyperactive disorder, endometriosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and multiple sclerosis and Killian bar disease. So these additional conditions are being added over time based on periodical review of the NHF program. We have also merged the cards. We have been listening to our um, beneficiaries. We usually have three cards, the NHF and the JADET. Now we've merged all the cards. So persons um, from birth to 60 uh, um, um, access the, the, the NHF card and um, persons 60 and over usually apply for the JADEP card. No, we have merged the JADEP cards. So persons who are celebrating their 60th year, 60th year will automatically benefit from the JADEP card. So per, it's just ease of processing for our, our clients as well. The benefits remain the same for our JADEP patients. Um, they still access the um, same amount of drugs, and they still pay the say the forty dollars um, service charge and the two hundred and forty dollars for six items or more. So we are encouraging persons to persons with the JADEP card only to upgrade to get the NHF card, but um, persons do not need to apply for the JADEP. Um, card anymore. You will just automatically um, access, access both benefits. The, because of this merger, we only have one application forms, and this would be most applicable for our doctors um, who is very integral in, in um, promoting the services and, and informing patients of the National Health Fund benefits. So previously we would have three forms. Now it's just merged into one application form. And the form will address all the, um, the issues from the previously three um, separate cards. So it manages the enrollment, change requests and card replacement. So going forward, we only use one application form. And that's just an, um, a copy of the form on screen. Now we've, um, since 2021, we've introduced a brand new program for our doctors and we're really um, encouraging our doctors to, to sign up to basically help the processing period for our patients. We have realized that a lot of times the patients will receive the application form at the doctor's office once diagnosed and on treatment but it takes them a while to reach our office. So they will be um, struggling with the burden of the financial costs and they still did not take their application form to the NHF. So we have introduced this brand new program just to <coughs> speed up the process for the application process. And we've introduced an online platform for registration of patients for the NHF card. This system can be used on desktop computer or mobile devices. There's no need to have the actual NHF form. With the system, doctor's offices using technology will never run out of the NHF form. And this basically came out of the COVID response where 
persons were transitioning online for many of their services. And this was one of the services that was implemented as well as an online um, process. So it's very easy to sign up. Um, how, to, how to join the online registration platform for doctors. There's a commitment form that we will email to the doctors once the email, once the commitment form is filled out correctly. Um, we, our customer service representative will, will um, send an email with a username, a password, and an electric signature. We are um, appealing to our doctors to keep this electric electronic signature dear to their heart. And, um, and um, once this process is completed, the doctors are able to start the process of um, filling out the information right there, um, sitting with their patients, um, starting the application process. So we, we ask the, the, the doctors to to fill out some sections of the form, including the section A with the patient's name and their TRN and their mobile number, and also the customary section C section where the illness is being indicated along with your signature, of course. So we've, we have seven, over 70 doctors on the program now and We've, we've gotten some great responses. I mean, even um, the other day we enrolled a doctor and the patient received the notification right there sitting at their desk that we have received your application. You can come in and pick up your NHF card. So we're trying to improve the process as best as possible to, to, to help our patients get the, the access and the benefits that they are in need of. So thank you so much for listening. The ways to contact us, we are online um, on, on social media. Our website is www.nhf.org. Persons can email us at info at nhf.org and telephone us. And we're also on web chat on our online platform. Thank you so much for having the National Health Fund. And we look forward to continuing partnership with our doctors and Jamaica Cancer Society. Thank you, Sharon. We always enjoy our partnership with the National Health Fund. They have really supported us throughout the years with offering the public access to free screening. And this, and this month of September, they've also donated 100 free screening of smear screen, prostate cancer screening, sorry for 100 men who would not have had access otherwise. So thanks again, Cheryl. Thank you very much. So we move straight into the vote of thanks. Mr. Michael Leslie, our Acting Executive Director and Financial Manager. Are you ready, sir? Yes, thank you, Julia. Well, we have come to the end of another very successful, informative prostate cancer Medical Symposium. It's all good to say thanks. Thank you, participants. I want to thank all the participants that came on board today to be a part of the symposium. We thank all our presenters. We have heard from some very um, knowledgeable and brilliant medical practitioners. I'm sure we have learned a lot from them today. Without our sponsors, we would not be here today. So I want to say thanks to our valued sponsors. I will name all our sponsors of this symposium. We thank the Jamaica Urological Society. We thank the Garden Group Foundation, Abbott Nutrition, Apex Radiology, Medical Products Limited, the National Health Fund, and Ferrin Pharmaceuticals. We thank you all for your usual and your consistent commitment to the Jamaican society as we continue to fight and continue to create the awareness. I want to thank our IT team led by Mr. Miguel, David Miguel. You were so professional in your duties today, Mr. Miguel. So we thank you for a job well done. And by la and last but by no 
but by no means least, I want to thank Trillian, Ms. Brown, our public relations and fundraising manager, along with Ms. Dion Thomas. These two ladies, you know, we thank you for putting on such a very, you know, and a successful symposium. You did a great job, ladies. And I must say, we look forward to having all our participants here today come next month as we celebrate Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We look forward to have you in our next symposium in October. We thank you all and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Liz. The symposium is on the 24th of October, starting at 9 a.m. All certificates will be emailed to participants and it is five CME credits. Thank you for your support.